Get access to hundreds more exclusive history documentaries by downloading the History Hit app. The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spy was very much part of the Cold War. and how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, mutually assured destruction. In episode five, advances in nuclear technology imperil the world again. Our two nations now have five times more missile warheads than we had just eight years ago. You know, tens, hundreds, thousands of systems, any one of which is capable of destroying the widespread peace of humanity in the blink of an eye. And the end of a war is never the end of the suffering. Nowadays, the bodies are just left there until they're mutilated by animals and the traffic. As the Cold War conflict spreads to a new continent, to learn what it is like to be under fire, three quivering recruits faced a Kalashnikov rifle. Boys next door become mass murderers. I went out there basically to <laughs> get enough money to buy a house. And the latest nuclear weapon is an invisible killer. A devilish weapon, basically. Totally inhuman. Chile, November 1970. An election victory will lead to the violent death of the nation's leader. It begins peacefully. The Chilean people vote in a socialist coalition. The year saw a unique political development in Latin America. In September, Dr. Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile, the first Marxist head of state on the continent to achieve power by democratic means. We were so happy because Allende represents a big change in the Chilean society. Well, my position initially was uh, in charge in the south of Chile, the agricultural ministry. Allende is originally a physician. This is his fourth attempt at winning power. He doesn't waste time turning his country around. Chile was governed by the oligarchy. And all those governments, they were a puppet from the United States. And they took the natural resource from Chile with the North American companies. Chile's great open cast mines produce the largest amount of copper in the world. The three biggest are American owned. Chile's Marxist president, Salvador Allende, nationalized American copper mines. The government also nationalized major banks and large land holdings. But worst of all for the Americans, Allende is a communist. And Chile is 6,000 kilometers south of the USA. Top secret moves are made in the United States at the highest level. Nixon said to Kissinger, you must stop the Allende government in any way. The government policies have failed. The Marxist theory does not work among a free people. No one knows at the time, but President Nixon is planning to end the rule of the communist government. Washington 
cuts off credit to Chile. The International Bank, the Monetary Fund, they closed and help with Chile. The Chilean economy slowed, food was scarce, and when anti-government demonstrations occurred, Allende declared a state of emergency and instituted food rationing. Tension in the country builds. We didn't have a strong perception of the American influence in Chile at that time. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit brings you the stories that shaped the world through exclusive documentaries from the world's top historians. Travel with us to the bloody Battle of Stalingrad or uncover the lives of the people who called Pompeii home. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. They were talking with different members of the army to convince them the necessity of overthrow the Allende government. Then the army tries to take over. You may be able to hear it. The, the fighting is now erupted in earnest. Chaos and terror hit the streets of Santiago. UPI cameraman, television cameraman, Ricardo Correa, was filming a part of a gun battle from the 11th floor office of the United Press International. The troops uh, on the street uh, saw the reflection of his camera, mistook it for a weapon, and riddled the office with rifle fire. The attempted coup fails, this time. Six weeks later, Allende is re-elected as president. But the peace does not last long. Meanwhile, striking truckers and their families camped out in fields near their idle vehicles. The army has seized most of the vehicles, but was searching for tow trucks because owner drivers had flattened tires and removed engine parts. Documents recently released reveal the USA funded the truck driver's strike. Even Allende, I think, he wasn't aware the American government can overthrow him. Just five days after it was formed, President Salvador Allende's cabinet has suffered its first casualty. General Cesar Ruiz quit his transport minister. He also resigned as Air Force commander. The Chilean economy collapses. The response is cataclysmic. While well, watching the Mineta being bombed was just unbelievable. There were two bomber pilots and they just, they'd fly around the building. They flew around our apartment building and bombed the Mineta and then they'd go around, they went around about 10 times. I thought will be some resistance, you know, because we don't believe all the army or all the armed force were with the coup. We were wrong. The military attack on the presidential palace is merciless. When the gunfire erupted in Chile 12 days ago, when the government of Salvador Allende overthrown, an estimated 350 Americans took shelter in Santiago and other cities. There was fighting going on between um, the snipers above us and the military men down below. So you were caught in the crossfire? Yeah. After three days, man from the Peace Corps came and got us out what? and escorted us out. You know, Salvador Allende, you know, he declared war on the middle class, and the middle class fought back. And they basically, they killed him. Within hours of the military coup, Allende is found dead in the Moneda Palace. He dies from a bullet wound to the head. It was probably suicide, but a debate has raged ever since. Many people say today, Allende committed suicide. But the 
information we received today, Allende was killed for General Palacios. And I personally have no sympathy for Marxism, but um, the government had been elected by the people, and uh, this is a military coup d'etat. The military leader is General Augusto Pinochet. Allende had appointed him commander-in-chief of the army only a month earlier. I will tell you very shortly, lo sucedido, what has happened in los últimos diez días, in the last ten days, the country, atravesado por una onda crisis, was going through a deep crisis. They broken my house, destroyed my books, and everything. And many people from this group were killed, like my dear friend, Dr. Hernan Enrique, who were disappeared, and they didn't refuse to give his call to his wife. Pinochet begins 17 years of a brutal military dictatorship. His government will kill over 3,000 people and torture more than 29,000. It was a terrorist state, you know. They used the power of the guns, you know, and the power of the army to create a, a silent society. Communism has been crushed in Chile, but the result is not freedom for the people. The 1970s, the Cold War is accelerating out of control. East and West are pushing even harder for bigger and better nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union and the United States have accumulated thousands of nuclear weapons. Our two nations now have five times more missile warheads than we had just eight years ago. But we are not five times more secure. There's supposedly very, very sophisticated command and control systems in place with both the United States and the Soviet Union really weren't very sophisticated at all. And it's sheer dumb luck that we avoided during the Cold War years and indeed subsequently a nuclear weapons catastrophe. By 1972, the USA has about 26,000 nuclear warheads. And the USSR has about 16,000. The United States and the Soviet Union are the only two countries that have the capability of a general nuclear war, and therefore the only countries that can end civilized lives as we know it. Ever since they first appeared, nuclear weapons have invariably been regarded as the most dangerous weapons of mass destruction. This is still true, all the more so since the capacity of those weapons is not a constant value. It is growing. Then start building them in volume, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of systems, any one of which is capable of destroying, you know, widespread uh, piece of humanity in the, in the blink of an eye. Both sides believe the only way to avoid annihilation is to be ahead of the other in destructive power. Missiles like the Pershing can deliver a nuclear warhead up to 1,600 kilometers. With its accuracy, it can penetrate small hardened targets or bury itself deep into the ground, creating an earthquake effect. This is the Boeing air-launched cruise missile being loaded into the bomb bay of a B-52. Formerly, this aircraft was the main strategic arm of the American nuclear deterrent. The most advanced element of the missile's construction, a map-reading computer, guides the weapon at ground-hugging height. At this level, the cruise would be difficult to detect in advance, as it would appear on a radar screen to be no larger than many birds. The Soviets will have an array of warheads with yields on the order of one megaton. Once you have that kind of an advantage, your competitor wants it. 
So there was really no way to avoid you know, massive effort by both the Western interests and the non-Western interests to uh, possess the capability, and once it's possessed, to improve it. This is why the Americans say their new weapons are needed. It's the Soviet backfire swing-wing bomber. 70 of these supersonic aircraft and 130 of the Russians' own mobile nuclear missiles, the SS-20, are said to have been deployed in Western Russia this year. Our political systems couldn't keep up with the technological developments. These were capabilities that were just almost unimaginable, and therefore the political and, and diplomatic processes, you know, were constantly trying to catch up. The latest development is one missile with many nuclear warheads, each capable of striking a different target. The multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle, or MIRV. The Soviets have successfully demonstrated in flight test the MIRV capability. There have been four ICBMs in development. Two of them have already been demonstrated with the MIRV capability. We expect that the MIRV capability is likely to be associated with the other two. Some of the Russian MIRVs have 38 warheads each. Just got out of control. It's that simple. But I would also not underrate the importance to humanity and to our own people of taking constant steps to, uh, to get the nuclear problem under some discipline. Both sides have already signed one treaty, SALT-1, to freeze ballistic missiles at 1972 levels. But it is not enough. The next treaty aims to put the nuclear war machine in reverse. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty 2, or SALT 2. There were moments and periods of real hope during the Cold War that sanity would prevail. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT, in the 70s. The United States alone cannot lift from the world the terrifying specter of nuclear destruction. We can and will work with others to do so. There's always been a deep understanding of the horrors associated with nuclear weapons, a deep understanding of their total unacceptability. The trouble is that hasn't stopped gigantic stockpiles of nuclear weapons accumulating up to 86,000, I think, was the, the highest total during the Cold War years. SALT II talks are given a boost by the new U.S. president. Well, I've heard great things about you and your service here in Washington. Thank you very much. I hope to form a very close relationship with you personally. And Thank you very much. And also with Mr. President. Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador here since the Kennedy days, brought with him a gift of hand-carved Russian dolls. As he began an official relationship with his fifth American president. Uh, president Carter's approach to uh, dealing with the Russians was I'm going to get inside the heads of the Soviet leaders and I'm persuasive enough and convincing enough that they will see our model is better than theirs. He was very, very sensible in his understanding of the risks associated with war and nuclear war in particular and made a pretty significant contribution to moving the game forward. And we will move this year a step toward our ultimate goal, the elimination of all nuclear weapons from this earth. More sensible, more humane heads uh, that just did understand the catastrophic risks involved and was very reluctant to engage in the kind of adventurism which um, you know, was so troubling with some other presidencies. Leaders on both sides no longer believe that war will be prevented by the fear of mutually assured destruction. The fear grows that despite MAD, someone could still push the button that would start World War III.
It is therefore always a possibility that misunderstandings may lead to confrontation. Salt 2 replaces mutually assured destruction with a new idea, detente. Thus we must be clear at the outset on what the term detente entails. It is the search for a more constructive relationship with the Soviet Union. Vietnam, after 12 years of superpower proxy war, there is a note of optimism. For the first time in 12 years, no American military forces are in Vietnam. All of our American POWs are on their way home. The 17 million people of South Vietnam have the right to choose their own government without outside interference. And because of our program of Vietnamization, they have the strength to defend that right. We have prevented the imposition of a communist government by force on South Vietnam. But President Nixon speaks too soon. When the supply of the military aids from the United States were cut off in late 1874, the result was inevitable. We couldn't fight with our bare fist. April. 1975, the Viet Cong have crossed the border dividing North and South. The surge towards the capital of South Vietnam begins. The battles for control of the roads leading to Saigon are now well underway. The long-awaited phase two of the communist spring offensive has begun. Bodies of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong enemy were left to rot in the streets. Nowadays, the bodies are just left there until they're mutilated by animals and the traffic. I lived my last days of the war in the front line because I was a medical doctor of a ranger regiment. They keep on raining on us with, with their most powerful um, artillery. And we all have to dig down in the ground and, and, and live like rats and in the trenches there. If you press your ears to the ground, you can hear the faint rumbling of enemy tanks in the vicinity, and that scare the hell out of everyone. We were in the hottest spot, and I was captured alive by the enemy. If you are in a starving condition and doing hard labor from dawn to dusk, all you can think of is food. All you can think of is a few minutes rest. They kind of reduce you to animal level, and that's brainwashing. In only a few days, the communists reached the outskirts of Saigon. The jets attacked during the rush hour in Saigon when the streets are packed with traffic. Shops, banks and offices were closed and people began jamming the streets all over again in their hurry to get home. The international community responds immediately to the invasion. As foreigners, mostly French and Americans and Germans, rushed to buy tickets for any flight out. Embassies evacuate their staff. Obviously, when you pull out of a place like this, there's criticism that you're going out too soon and maybe promoting evacuation panic. No, I don't think one could be said to be doing that. You've seen for yourself the flood of Americans going out. Saigon, April the 30th, 8 o'clock. The last American helicopter on the roof of the American embassy prepares to lift off the last of the evacuees fleeing before the advancing communist armies. Most foreigners manage to escape, but the South Vietnamese are left to their fate. 
and for hours after the last departure, scores of people still crowded onto the embassy roof in the vain hope of rescue. I don't think these people up here are committing suicide staying up here, but what can you do? Hundreds scrambled in panic onto any boats they could reach, not caring how they got aboard or what they left behind. After several failed attempts, finally me and my fiance, who's my wife now, we escaped together. We knew the, the danger, but we decided we better either live in freedom together or die together. And it was a very, very treacherous sea journey in a very small boat, nine meter long, 33 people. And on the boat, you know, you can just touch the water here because it's so overloaded. The capital of South Vietnam awaits the arrival of the victors. And then, shortly after midday, came the climax of 30 years of fighting. They were a disciplined force. Among the thousands who arrived, there wasn't a single reported case of theft, drunkenness, rape, or shooting. People who hours earlier had feared for their lives now turned out on the streets to cheer and welcome. The sense of relief in Saigon was almost tangible. Not everyone saw defeat so optimistically. This officer shot himself in front of the soldiers' monument a couple of hours before the communists entered the city. On the 30th of April, Saigon fell, and the, the then President Zeng Wenmin capitulated. And tears streamed down my face. I cried silently for my country. It was a very, very powerful feeling of anger, frustration, and hatred. Hatred, hatred for, for the betrayal of allies. People will always agree with the word losing, but that's what it was, we lost. When South Vietnam fell, seven other countries fell in very rapid succession to communism. As the first day of peace for 30 years dawned in Vietnam, the banks and some shops remained closed. But in Saigon's markets, it was business as usual. There were, of course, some changes. In the main market, traders were quick to peddle a new line in flags. Hanoi was calling the tune now, and everyone had to march to it. I think South Vietnam is just a victim in the global chess game. As the parade of hardware went on, the overriding impression was one of finality, that the communists had established beyond all question a tight and unopposed control over the land and people that had suddenly become theirs. As one proxy war ends, another is firing up. This one will last 27 years. It will cause just as much death and destruction as Vietnam. 1975, Angola is on the rebound from colonial occupation. The Portuguese have just pulled out. They just left the freedom uh, movements had to fend for themselves. The, it was the survival of, this, of, the, of the strongest. MPLA then 
was the one that uh, was strong in Luanda, the capital, and therefore was on hand on the 11th of November, 75, to declare independence. Power is taken by the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, the MPLA. The popular movement was born during the 14-year guerrilla campaign against the Portuguese. The MPLA is communist. It has both popular support and Soviet weaponry. The Russian BM-21 rocket launcher, devastating weapon in their armory. Each lorry can fire 40 high-explosive rockets each with a range of 12 miles. To learn what it is like to be under fire, three quivering recruits faced a Kalashnikov rifle and a machine gun firing live ammunition. The Soviet Union itself, I mean, could not send its own soldiers there. Uh, they, they, I think there's a protocol that exists between uh, Moscow and Washington that, that they themselves physically should not be involved. They send their allies. The National Liberation Front of Angola, the FNLA, and the National Union for Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, also fight for control. Eight weeks ago, these young men were in the Angolan bush or living in the shanty towns of Angola's cities. Now, after an intensive course of Cuban and Russian instruction, they are set to join the popular movement's 30,000-man army. The Soviet Union has sent close to $200 million worth of uh, military equipment to Angola in the last nine months. Between five and 7,000 Cuban military forces are in Cuba, are in uh, Angola, and the, in fact, they seem to be everywhere except in Cuba. Uh. It was, again, uh, this external issue of what was called the Cold War. This one is uh, support the Marxist, Leninist, uh, and the other one is capitalist, Washington, you had to choose sides. You could not be in Angola now without being for and against. So that, that was quite traumatic. There were proxy wars going on all around the place. Angola uh, was another absolutely catastrophic one. In Africa, massive death tolls. We just forget the scale of this sort of stuff that was going on year after year, often accompanied by atrocity crimes and just the worst kind of behavior imaginable. Those people, they don't know what you're fighting about. They just want to go on with their ordinary life, to go and till the fields rear their goats and sheep and cattle. They don't know all these big principles about democracy and Marxism. And... The USA supports the opposing factions, the FNLA and UNITA. MPLA is getting more arms, is getting more tanks, is getting more Cuban mercenaries. So we are prepared to meet any offensive against us from the MPD. Angola is a very big country, being in somewhat in Central Africa, that if the Soviets were able to really create a, uh, a vassal state uh, in uh, Angola uh, using their troops and Cuban troops, that that could be a base from which communism could spread throughout the African continent. We know that uh, the Soviets have picked one side and automatically we pick the other. Well, we uh, are on the verge of spending uh, our first hundred million dollars and might be more than that. 
Uh, Angola had a lot of fertile uh, grounds and they had uh, a number of minerals. They did have oil. Well, Angola was a source of mineral resources and uh, deeply attractive as a war zone between the, the major powers uh, as a result, neither wanting the other side to get their hands on these kinds of resources. American support includes money and weapons. The USA also attempts to cover its tracks. They do not send soldiers. They send the means for the anti-government forces to acquire them. The CIA is providing money for the FNLA and UNITA to pay mercenaries. And this Corvette is not something that you can report to the U.S. Congress. It, it's a covert thing. You kill and uh, everyone will say, you terrible atrocities. Uh, people burned uh, alive in their sleep. Oh, terrible people, and so forth. Not knowing that they are funded by the CIA. To press the point home, some posters showed a mercenary helmet with American dollars pouring from it. Mercenaries, people who take part in armed conflict in foreign nations for private gain. These guns for hire bulk up the FNLA and UNITA forces. The term mercenary always has a bit of a bad name uh, as it relates to Angola. So it's people really, their, their starting point and their end point is money. With a huge supply of men and machinery on both sides, the Angolan people are swamped by a massive war. They were really dangerous times. There were always breaks on the likelihood of the Soviet Union and the United States actually going to the brink as, and, and over the brink as against each other. But none of those restraints seem to apply in terms of uh, the benighted masses in Africa and elsewhere who were, you know, pawns in this larger game. The effects uh, of the Angolan War on the people were very, very uh, bad. It kept the na nation in a very impoverished state for a long time. A lot of landmines were put out, a lot of limbs were lost, a lot of people were killed, villages destroyed. This 10-year-old boy was seriously hurt in the attack on Kahama. His leg has been severed. The civilians have fled. Kahama has been abandoned to the cows and the soldiers. The people of, of Angola were, were really, really suffering, and uh, all the resources were going towards the war effort. Completely, what should be going to education, to health, to housing, to road infrastructure, and so forth. The prolonged conflict and the deaths and destruction and so forth. That, that hurt. As far as fighting is concerned, for us, the Cubans or the Russians have no right to kill Angolans. I don't prefer anyone. I prefer the Angolans to be uh, left alone so they solve their problems. The mercenaries have a reputation for brutality. They are also illegal under the Geneva Convention. There was uh, a number of mercenaries from different uh, countries that went up to fight on both sides, both with the communist forces and the Western-backed forces. And so there were a lot of uh, uh, executions and extrajudicial uh, killings that went on during that period. If captured, mercenaries are not classified as prisoners of war they are tried as common criminals. Luanda, capital of newly independent Angola. The men in the dock are mercenaries. Their leader was Costas Georgiou, who went under the name of Colonel Callan. All my men, which have captured the so-called mercenaries, and all the rest of my soldiers, which you have captured, were all under my direct command. So any responsibility and any charges against them, okay? They were following my orders. They were just soldiers. 13 men are under trial for their lives. Three are Americans, and the other 10 are British. They were paid to fight against the MPLA, the 
movement which won the civil war and which now runs Angola. Having been captured in action, they have now been charged with crimes against peace and against Angola. Barker, do you still maintain that you do not want a British lawyer? I trust in the Angolan people. I hope to have a fair trial for the Angolan people. I want an Angolan lawyer. Many of the mercenaries have had no military training prior to joining Callan's army. Was it really worth all the trouble and all the, all the, all the killing? Yeah, I'd go back again, yeah. Why? Uh, to fight communism. I went out there basically to, <laughs> to get enough money to buy a house. There'd been a total of about 200 British mercenaries involved in the war. Some of the men on trial were caught by Callan himself and treated as deserters. Who are you under? Callan. I'm under Callan. He's commander of the North. He was a nutter. Fourteen British mercenaries, it's alleged, met their death at Michaela. One of them was killed by Callan himself. The others were shot on his orders by a group led by Callan's second in command. He had shot the young soldier. Copeland mm -hmm. then took the rejects away, stripped of their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And put them into the back of a truck. And they were driven away. And the next, really, that anybody heard was a sort of long burst of firing. Most observers felt that though the death penalty had been asked for, it was unlikely to be carried out on anyone, apart perhaps from Callan. That's what I want to say. And I don't want to answer no more questions. Okay? No disrespect. The verdict is guilty. The crimes include murder. The sentences are severe. Nine of the men are given 16 to 30 years in jail. The other four get worse. Their leader, Costas Giorgio, AKA Tony Callan, is joined by Andrew McKenzie age 25, Derek Barker, age 35, and Daniel Gearhart, age 34. They are sentenced to be shot. We have appealed to uh, over 10 countries. There's been a direct appeal to uh, President Neto. There has been an appeal through international organizations like the International Red Cross. The American and British governments talk directly to Angolan President Agostino Neto. President Neto himself uh, stated that he would wait before signing the order for execution until he had looked at the world reaction to the death sentence which has been handed down by the tribunal. Mrs. Gerhardt, if you could talk to the, the Angolan president directly, what would you say to him? To add plate clemency for the commuting of his sentence. Ten days later, all four convicted mercenaries are lined up to face an MPLA firing squad. Andrew McKenzie is in a wheelchair as the result of combat injuries. He chooses to stand for his execution. The Angolan War will escalate before it ends. A huge new wave of American and Russian support will fan the flames. The fighting and atrocities will continue until 2002. Amazingly, negotiating teams from the East and West managed to keep the SALT II talks going. Building a relationship between governments that have been opponents for 30 years is not easy. NATO estimates that the Warsaw Pact has almost three times as many battle tanks as the West. The Russian foreign minister argued that there was no imbalance and that NATO and the Warsaw Pact had parity in military strength. Arguments continue on both sides about the finer points of the treaty. It does not permit the Soviet Union to build one additional modern ballistic missile on submarines above the level of 950 that we agreed upon. 
both sides have developed different nuclear strategies. The USA has focused on missile accuracy. While the USSR has been developing even larger warheads. By now, the world has enough weapons to destroy itself several times over. And there's still no agreement on how to stop the buildup. We have uh, continued our discussions with the Soviet Union uh, on salt and other matters. In March, when I was there, the Soviet Union made a proposal which in concept was worth looking at, though its numbers were not, have not proved acceptable to us. Just as SALT II is making progress, a chilling headline stops everything. June 1977, a new nuclear weapon is being developed. Lack of communication in government meant that the US president is not told about it. Jimmy Carter finds out when a Washington Post headline flashes across the globe. The neutron bomb was a development of the thermonuclear weapons, a devilish weapon, basically, totally inhuman. The neutron bomb. Tests have been covertly carried out in Nevada back in 1963. Research continued quietly under Nixon and Ford. The neutron bomb, when we, when we heard the news of that, I mean, it's the, the ultimate sort of doomsday weapon in a sense, I suppose, killing people without knocking over buildings. President Carter defines himself as a peacemaker. But the tank force of the Soviet-controlled Eastern Bloc countries is about three times that in Western Europe. Despite the horrific implications, Carter sees the neutron weapon as the only way to stop a Soviet land invasion. The neutron weapon is designed to use to be used against a massive and perhaps overwhelming tank forces. You could actually stop an invasion with neutron bombs by killing all the tank crews, all the infantry, and everything else, and keeping their tanks and uh, and stopping stopping the advance. The neutron bomb has a small blast range, but releases ten times the amount of lethal radiation. This new weapon has not yet been deployed, but it is already causing unrest. The Russian foreign minister stated bluntly that NATO's expected decision to station the new nuclear weapons in Western Europe would destroy the basis for negotiations on further disarmament. Despite international objections, President Carter tries to sell this new weapon to countries in Europe. Now, we're not building these weapons for ourselves. We're building these weapons for our NATO allies to, to uh, protect their territory. Anti-bomb demonstrations flare up all over Europe. The answer is no decision has been made with respect to the neutron bomb. Then the game changes. The USSR detonates its own enhanced radiation weapon. President Carter has uh, made publicly known uh, his uh, postponement of taking a decision on production of those weapons in order to, in the meantime, ask the Soviet Union to respond in kind. Hastily convened negotiations secure a pledge from the Russians. The public pressure in Europe does not abate. Carter decides to shelve the neutron bomb. The decision has been taken right now. We uh, think it's a wise one, politically, diplomatically, and the framework of our common desire for arms limitation. Work on another terrible weapon of the Cold War is stopped, and not a single neutron bomb is sent to Europe. Strategic arms limitation talks have been going on for seven years. 
lack of progress in nuclear disarmament fuels public anger across the West. Finally, in June 1979, there is a breakthrough. Today, we are on the threshold of signing a strategic arms agreement that achieves our purpose. Mr. Brezhnev came to Vienna in June to sign SALT II, perhaps the most significant arms limitation agreement since the Second World War. SALT II sets regulations on many types of missiles, and it commits the USA and the USSR to limit their nuclear weapon systems to 2,400 each. This is a milestone in the Cold War. Mad World, Mutually Assured Destruction. In part six, a surprise move reignites the Cold War. A Soviet helicopter gunship. The only precaution is to keep as still as possible. International animosity reaches into the sporting arena. I would implore all those with different opinions and feelings not to make use of the Olympic Games to divide the world, but to unite it. As the threat of war increases, the FBI is on the trail of a deep cover agent. And he came out of this little room we had him in. He said if this guy was a spy, the loss is, is unbelievable. A wrong turn results in a mid-air catastrophe. It is clear beyond any doubt that the Soviet Union did in fact shoot down this unarmed commercial airliner. And Western Europe is put on high alert. If anybody crosses that line, you shoot them dead on British territory. We could be faced with concealment, countermeasures, and so-called cheating of all sorts, because without SALT, all of these actions would be permitted. July 1979. The world relaxes as Cold War tensions abate. SALT II has been signed. Nuclear disarmament is in progress, and detente seems to be working. Then, people start to evacuate a landlocked country in Central Asia. It's just a very orderly evacuation, just for precautionary measures. I think there are uh, probably about a uh, hundred official Americans that are leaving. Or the uh, we do know that uh, there is uh, insurgency activity in the country, and uh, our uh, charge affairs has asked us to. Uh, parts of us official Americans to uh, leave the country until the situation stabilizes. Refugees start to cross the border in huge numbers. In Afghanistan, 200,000 people are now living in exile in Pakistan. 200,000 people who have lost their home, their shelter, their clothing, they have got nothing. They depend on you support. Friction in Afghanistan has been building for over a year since a Marxist government took control. In December, the Afghan government takes action. The limited contingent of the Soviet armed forces came to Afghanistan on the request of the Revolutionary Council and the government of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan in accordance with the United Nations Charter. January 1980, Barbara Kamal is escorted by the Soviet army to Afghanistan and is installed as president. The West sees this as an invasion by the USSR. Americans realized that uh, Afghans had been pressured into it or people had been paid off. Uh, that really was um, a tantamount to a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Such gross interference in the internal affairs of Afghanistan is in blatant violation 
of accepted international rules of behavior. That the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan has dangerously transformed the character of existing political and strategic arrangements in this region, and that therefore there ought to be a sustained effort to ensure the security of the threatened region. Despite the outcry from the USA, they have also been interfering in Afghan affairs. America has been covertly supplying money and weapons to the anti-government rebels for over a year. President Kamal needs Soviet assistance to stay in power. I must also add that we are grateful to the Soviet Union, our great neighbor in the north, for all the help and assistance they had given us. Soviet Union uh, felt like they were very much more powerful in the 70s because of uh, our failure in Vietnam and the conversion of many countries to communism, and they, so they felt like they were on the march, they were on the move. This is a third occasion since World War II that the Soviet Union has moved militarily to assert control over one of its neighbors. For the first time, Jimmy Carter uh, admitted that he uh, finally uh, realized uh, what the uh, Soviet Union uh, was all about. Well, the uh, Americans uh, were not quite sure what to do uh, with regard to Afghanistan. Uh, there was concern that uh, uh, the country is, is so impossible to manage and govern, uh, even by the Afghanis, and, and nobody else has ever really won the war there. The anti-government rebels call themselves the Mujahideen. My dad was supporting uh, Mujahideen, and um, he was never happy for the Russians to uh, come to Afghanistan and occupy my country. My uncles uh, from both sides, from my mother's side and from my dad's side, were fighting against uh, Russians. They were in the Mujahideen uh, forces. Do you think that the, the Mujahideen alone can get the Soviet army out of Afghanistan and topple the government? Uh, really, it is a difficult job, really. It's not easy. Yeah. My Afghanistan people, they are very poor and they have not enough arms against these uh, modern uh, weapons of Russia. But uh, the people in other countries, they could support the Mujahideen, providing arms, weapons, money, food, clothes, medicine, anything. The Mujahideen are alarmed by Soviet occupation of other Muslim nations. We have seen what happened in, uh, you know, Central Asians, Asian republics. Uh, now, you know, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, all the other uh, republics. They are going to need millions of dollars worth of arms to fight the Soviet army. The U.S. goes public with its fight against the communist Afghan government. They figured. You know, we're not going to go in there and, and let it become a graveyard for our people. The Soviets are in there. They've already made the commitment. So let's just funnel aid to the Northern Alliance and then to the, the broader group called the Mujahideen and uh, just make the Soviets pay the price for uh, kind of getting going into the wrong place at the wrong time. Once the assistance comes, we will be in better shape to continue our struggle against God godless the Stalinist Soviets uh, with the necessary need of us supplied. We do have some tanks, machine guns, and rifles, but it is not enough. Many of the Mujahideen are Muslim fundamentalists. They seek support from wealthy Arab nations. I ask uh, the Saudi Arabian for an allocation of $2 billion fund to finance the war, the holy war in Afghanistan. Money and arms pour into both sides. The war flares up. I don't think they were there just for Afghanistan. They were there to reach to the warm waters, and they wanted to expand, uh, you know, their wings and become even bigger. So they were not there just.
to come and occupy Afghanistan and stop there. Afghan resistance to the Soviet invasion has been so fierce that the country is now closed to Western newsmen. The only way open is to enter disguised as an Afghan freedom fighter. Soviet MiG fighters streak past on a bombing run against a town in a distant valley. For this operation, MiG-21s and Mi-24 helicopter gunships, allegedly using napalm and rockets, blasted the small town and the surrounding hills. The rebels in the hills had no chance. In Asma itself, 1,500 inhabitants are believed to have died. It's the piece of weaponry most feared by the rebels, a Soviet helicopter gunship. Again, the only precaution is to keep as still as possible. I remember um, distinctively um, around 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, there would be roaring of uh, Russian tanks uh, because our house was not far from the main road in the west of uh, Kabul. So that was the supply route for, you know, Russian uh, soldiers. More and more Afghan villagers evacuate their homeland. As in all wars today, the scale of suffering is most visible in the refugee camps. Here in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, 600,000 Afghan refugees who have poured across the Khyber Mountains now form the largest concentration of refugees in the world. Most of the men in this camp have been involved in fighting the Russians. They seem undaunted by the massive Soviet presence. The war we always thought was the war of uh, ideologies and the war, uh, it became later on that, you know, Islam is under attack in that region. So that was how the war was sold inside those camps, refugee camps, that Islam is under attack. So you need to be mobilized to defend Islam from Russia. For by common consent, the main aim of these hospitals is to patch up the wounded rebels and send them back into Afghanistan as soon as they are able to fight again. We, we don't think about losing or uh, winning the war. We want to fulfill our duties, and if we uh, are killed, we are killed in the way of God Almighty. One well-meaning relief organization recently sent the hospital a shipment of contraceptives. As one doctor said, not a lot of use. We need more Mujahideen, not less. Rumors grow. The Afghan freedom fighters are seeking to wipe out more than just communism. The Russian news agency releases alarming reports. In the past year, according to TASS, anti-government rebels have destroyed 1,100 schools, almost a quarter of Afghanistan's total. These bandits and saboteurs are said to have murdered teachers, beheaded students, and set fire to schools in a recent campaign of terror. The Afghanistan war has become much more than a battle of Cold War ideologies. It is a religious war. Independent reports from Kabul and around other parts of Afghanistan say there is every sign that the Russians are preparing for a long stay. My dad was uh, supporting uh, Mujahideen. Uh, we were always fearful that one day, uh, you know, the government uh, forces or the intelligence could find this out and could pick my dad and we would never see him again. It happened to so many people, you know, overnight, people would come. Some of them ended up in jail. Quite a few of them disappeared and they were killed. By the end of 1980, it appears that Afghanistan will not find peace for some time to come. Now there is no an area which is completely under control of Russians. 
more than 80% of Afghan territories under control of Mujahid. If the Russians withdraw from Afghanistan, is your struggle then over? Till we are not able to establish a pure Islamic system in Afghanistan, we will continue our struggle. The USA moves to use more than military to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan. In 1980, Moscow was hosting the Olympic Games. In the view of my government, it would be a violation of this fundamental Olympic principle to conduct or attend Olympic Games in a nation which is currently engaged in an aggressive war and has refused to comply with the world community's demand to halt its aggression and to withdraw its forces. The USA calls for an international boycott of the games. Robust opposition to the US call erupts. Solutions to the political problems of the world are not the responsibility of sporting bodies, such as the International Olympic Committee. We already see the nation selected as host of the Summer Games describing its selection as recognition of the correctness of its foreign policy course and its enormous services in the struggle for peace. In Moscow's Palace of Congresses, Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev recently accused the United States of going into hysterics over Afghanistan. One cannot ignore the increasing violence and intolerance in the world. I would implore all those with different opinions and feelings, not to make use of the Olympic Games, to divide the world, but to unite it. Uproar spreads across the global athletic community. For the boycott to work, the U.S. needs much more support. They decide to call on the help of the biggest athlete of all. I was made to believe that Russia is invading a Muslim country, which could lead to nuclear war. Muhammad Ali is persuaded to visit a string of African nations to gain support for the U.S. Olympic boycott. And if the African people help by not going to the Olympics, I figured this would help show the Russians and the world what they're doing. Kenya is out of the Moscow Olympics. Kenya will not go. And we consider this a big victory because Kenya is just about number one in track and field. And what is the Olympics without Kenya, America, and quite a few more countries for sure that's going to support it. A conference is called in Geneva by the United Kingdom. That there is a substantial likelihood of a boycott by United States athletes of the Olympics in Moscow. This may well be followed by a boycott by other major sporting countries. And this clearly will affect the quality of the competition in Moscow. It was here, in this city-state of ancient Greece, where the Olympic Games were born. But the Olympic spirit is no longer burning brightly. The Soviet involvement in Afghanistan and the resulting international protests have cast a long shadow over this year's Summer Olympics in Moscow, with the United States leading calls for a boycott. Two months before the Games begin, the boycott is confirmed. The modern Olympics were revived by Baron Pierre de Coubertin at the end of the last century. They draw their ideals from the ancient Greeks, who for over a thousand years refused to allow politics or wars to interrupt them. Many Muslim and African nations joined the boycott as well as China, Spain and West Germany. A total of 50 countries agreed to keep their athletes away from Moscow. In 
modern times, there have already been two interruptions for world wars, and today the whole future of the Games is under threat. The boycott of the Moscow Olympics by the Americans really affected the Games in a sporting sense, of course, because though obviously some of the leading competitors would have been American and Soviets. In the meantime, as the Western world debates what to do, and as athletes agonize over whether they should or shouldn't participate in the Moscow Olympics, the war victims seem half forgotten. And these Afghan wrestlers are expected, unlike many other athletes, to take part in the Olympic Games in Moscow. Greek actress Maria Moscoliu recites the traditional words in the Temple of Hera. If the old Greek gods can hear and see, they may well be puzzled and probably even angered by the latest crisis threatening the Games. It's a great loss for the sports people. I could really empathize with them because you're training for four years. It could be a major milestone in your career, and all of a sudden it's kind of kicked out from under your feet. But that's politics. 80 countries participate in a much diminished Olympic Games. Time begins its long journey, but could this be the last time? The Cold War has been reignited by the Soviet military presence in Afghanistan. The Soviet Union reinforces its defenses against NATO in Europe. The world is once again on alert for a nuclear World War III. The Warsaw Pact, as demonstrated at exercises such as this, has arrayed a formidable armory to set against NATO. NATO estimates that the Warsaw Pact has almost three times as many battle tanks as the West. NATO countries are not capable of matching the conventional military strength of the Eastern Bloc. Despite a strategic arms limitation treaty, they come up with a nuclear solution. The Hague and European defense ministers arrive for a NATO planning meeting. At stake, one of the most crucial decisions in the Alliance's history. Until now, the size of NATO's conventional forces and the effectiveness of America's nuclear umbrella have been the keys of the organization's defense strategy. Now the Americans want their European allies to share the nuclear burden and place on European soil for the first time medium-range nuclear missiles capable of striking at the Soviet Union. The missile selected for the European nuclear capability will go down in history as the weapon that fired up a continent. It's called a cruise missile. With its small fins, it's basically a more sophisticated version of the Second World War V-1 flying bomb. Because of its relative simplicity, it costs only about a thirtieth of a sophisticated modern jet fighter. Nuclear armed, it has a range of over 2,000 kilometers. Europe explodes in outrage. There have been no large protests like this for years, but the collapse of detente has heightened world tension. These people are protesting against American missiles planned for the UK. They fear Britain will become a major Soviet target. A single megaton blast would destroy buildings within two miles, burn people within ten. Defense planners think the Soviets could target 200 megatons on Britain. The cruise missiles are secretly flown to mainland Europe and Britain. The British-based missiles are installed on a massive Air Force base in rural southern England, RAF 
Greenham Common. These American missiles were based in silos underneath the ground uh, in their firing uh, trucks ready to go. The silos were coated with meters of concrete, holes in the ground basically, with obviously entrances and exits where the trucks were stored, surrounded by rather like the Iron Curtain razor tape and rather large South uh, South States American military policemen armed who were briefed very clearly if anybody crosses that line you shoot them dead on British territory. If the peace people were going to get 30,000 people to come to Greenham Common to demonstrate against the missiles, to knock the fence down, the government were very embarrassed. We had to stop these women intruding onto the base. The perimeter was 14 kilometers long, a lot of it through woodland, so it was very difficult to see people creeping up to the fence. And we made a plan of action to defend this 14 kilometer site. I was going to be airborne all day in a helicopter. On the day, it all passed without, I mean, they, they, they destroyed some of the fence, but they didn't get in. Remarkably, no guns were fired. Peace protesters will remain camped on the perimeter of RAF Greenham Common for a further 19 years. The Cold War is in full force once again. Many believe nuclear war is almost inevitable. One big question hangs in the air. Is it possible to survive such a war? Early warning radar stations like this have long been the key to Britain's home defense policy. These men can warn of attacks, bomb blasts and fallout. That information would trigger population alerts through sirens and nationwide media. If a nuclear attack occurs, everything above ground will be lethally radioactive. The regional center would get information from field outposts like this, 900 of them across Britain. Soldiers would be expected to emerge to collect data from fallout measuring equipment. Every nation within reach of Soviet and American missiles must have a survival plan. The radar station will send data to government control regional centers like this one in Birmingham. These are volunteers. So the circle, if you join it up at the top, that's right. So round to about there. Here, underground, standby generators power air conditioning that cuts out radioactive dust. The recent period of warming relations with the Soviet Union has left them dangerously unprepared. Workers plan to alert villages by phone, yet phone lines would probably be down. This information booklet is only now being distributed. British officials have feared people would lose it or be scared by it. Would they know what to do in an alert? In a world of accelerating technology, it seems ordinary people have been left behind. In this village, there are regular home defense meetings at the local pub. Tired army officer organizes the meetings. Surrounded by swords and history books, he quietly assesses the horrors of nuclear war. Fallout radiation, refugees. As tensions rise, civil defense becomes a major priority. Studies at Hiroshima, after the atomic explosion in 1945, have given scientists valuable information on how to protect a population from an attack. Across the Atlantic, the USA has been running war drills since the 1950s. All quiet in New York, if you can ever call New York quiet. What I mean is business as usual, with Times Square echoing to the everyday normal roar of the big city. Then sirens sound the alarm. 
The life of New York stops as the city's millions react to a mock attack by enemy raiders of this atomic age. From the stock exchange to air raid shelters, New York tests its civil defense. Judged by these pictures, New Yorkers certainly know their drill. And we would do bomb tests as children in elementary school, not bomb tests, but we would prepare for the atom bomb by uh, sitting in the hall and putting uh, our hands over our heads and, <laughs> and bending down as if that would do anything. North America has been leading the way in an essential addition to homes for the nuclear age, fallout shelters. Do-it-yourself fallout shelters, this above-ground model at Thomasville, Georgia, and the basement model at Wheaton, Maryland, are open for public inspection. Both are basically the same as to interior construction and decor. Both are designed and built by the government to specifications any around-the-house handyman can easily cope with. All the details are in a civil defense pamphlet, The Family Fallout Shelter, blueprints for survival in this age of atomic peril. Meanwhile, in Vancouver, Canada, a gentleman who prefers to remain anonymous is determined to protect himself against atomic warfare. His bomb-proof shelter has a Geiger counter for checking radioactivity. The door is heavily insulated with lead to prevent radioactive penetration. Yes, he's well equipped to see it through. His supplies in the shelter, including an oxygen tank. Nuclear shelters have been in the news ever since the first atomic bomb was dropped on a living city. In this second phase of the Cold War, many nations now consider them essential. Switzerland has one of the most advanced public defense plans. Here, every building less than 15 years old has its own fallout shelter. The government pays half, the house owner pays the rest. They're fully equipped. They know how to use air filters. They know the need for real protective doors and the need for proper shelter sanitation. And for housing developments, the program includes communal shelters like this one and they're maintained in spotless condition for any emergency. The flaring up of the Cold War reignites an undercover world. 1985 was known as the year of the spy. There were five or six cases in that single year that were significant espionage cases that the FBI uh, uh, made arrests and, and got convictions. One of the biggest spy scandals of the 80s will be handed to FBI Special Agent Joe Wolfinger. I began as an FBI agent in 1969, and the Cold War was in full bloom. I uh, worked criminal cases for a, a few years, but then uh, began to work counterintelligence, uh, counterespionage, if you will. John Walker works in the codes department of the U.S. Navy. His marriage breakdown is about to get him into serious trouble. When his uh, former wife, uh, from whom he was divorced, uh, got drunk one day and called the FBI to report that her husband, uh, former husband, had been uh, a spy for 20 years. And she said she believed that he made a million dollars from espionage over 20 years. The FBI investigates. We had the National Security Agency send a guy down, and he came out of this little room we had him in, and he was ashen. He said, if this guy was a spy, then the, uh, the loss is, is unbelievable. 
Walker was um, in charge of codes on Navy ships and communicating with Navy ships. The code, of course, is something that uh, protects a message from being understood uh, by the other side. As the agents dig deeper, they discover Walker may have revealed the plans and positions of troops during the Vietnam War. I had no doubt once I understood that this was a real case and that he had done that for 20 years, that uh, there were widows at Virginia Beach, and Norfolk, uh, whose husbands were killed because John Walker compromised naval communications. The challenge is to prove Walker is a spy. Wolfinger and his team watch Walker day and night. We followed him on May the 19th, 1985, from his house. But when he got to um, Richmond, he turned north, and um, we knew uh, something is going to happen here. The FBI agents believe Walker is on his way to make a drop. A drop, of course, is where a spy, like John Walker, uh, would make an exchange and then go to a place, uh, a specific place, and put a package down that contained classified information. Go someplace else and pick up a package that would contain money. As the day unfolds, Walker places a bag under a tree. Nine o'clock or so, uh, Bruce Bray, an FBI agent assigned to Washington, came running out of the woods with a bag under his arms and he shouted into the radio, I've got it, I've got it, I can see it. It's got secret stuff in it. The agents have their evidence. They track Walker to a motel. We knew Walker was armed, but when he was confronted the night that he was arrested and he had a gun in his hand, and for a moment, they were face to face. And then Walker dropped, the, dropped his gun and he was arrested. Interrogation reveals Walker had been spying for the USSR since 1968, but he is not a communist. Uh, I'm certain that his motivation was financial, uh, was money. Despite the huge victory, the USA believes John Walker is just the tip of the iceberg. There's no way to know the answer to the question, how many John Walkers were out there and we didn't know. Um, I think we were uh, pretty successful, um, but you can never be sure that you've got them all. We had spies too, uh, I'm sure, at least I hope we did. The decade of the most intense spying activity in the Cold War ends badly for John Walker. The government wanted Walker to talk, and he ended up with a life sentence and never got out. So you can't do any better than that unless you execute him. But the execution option wasn't there. 1981. The victims of the latest Cold War conflict are gathering in ever greater numbers on the Pakistani border with Afghanistan. This is now said to be the largest concentration of refugees in the world, possibly numbering as many as two million, or one-seventh of Afghanistan's entire population. The war in this mountainous country has been raging for two years. Despite U.S. government support, the anti-government rebellion is not making headway. They now find themselves in the front line of the renewed Cold War, the souring of relations between East and West, to which the Soviet intervention contributed in no small part. There's been a steady stream of Afghans across the mountains and into the tent encampments that have sprung up in the Northwest Frontier Province and Baluchistan. Reports from inside Afghanistan reveal what has driven these people from their homes. As we entered the town of Pagman itself, 7,000 feet up in the mountains, we heard but could not see shelling. 
Pac-Man is a ruined shadow of its once glorious past. Before the Soviet intervention, it was a town of tree-lined streets and villas built by King Amanullah in the 20s and 30s after independence from Britain. Now the town is ringed by 70 Afghan army posts commanding the surrounding hilltops. Many injured civilians are sent to a hospital in Kabul. At a hospital in the capital, the victims of a war they're too young to understand. These children were injured in a rebel rocket attack. According to doctors, the missiles rarely hit their intended targets, government military installations, landing instead in heavily populated civilian areas. And he was uh, active on the roads of Jalalabad, which is uh, 25, 30 kilometers east of Kabul. And he has got a bullet in his chest. President Max, he is about seven, eight years old. He was wounded by a booby trap. There were quite a few neighbors of us lost due to these rockets. There was one rocket hit not far from my house, maybe three houses away from where I lived. And, you know, I lost a dear friend. Despite the devastation, some choose not to flee. Hidden in the ruins, some people are trying to live a normal life. As we found inside the town hall, there is also some kind of administrative structure working. It's run by the mayor, 31-year-old Mohammed Akbar, who was elected last year and seems to be the driving force keeping life in Pagman going. Unannounced, we traveled seven miles to a village from a distance apparently deserted and damaged. Within minutes, a gaggle of children and elders gathered round as if from nowhere. In one dark building, we found a mullah teaching a class of children. Sometimes uh, the street where my uh, grandfather used to live, um, you know, the situation would be really, really bad. Uh, you know, there was active uh, war, a fight between Mujahideen and the government forces. You know, for a moment, people would hide, but after the fight was over, life would be normal, you know. They would just go on about their life and they would do whatever they, they used to do just before that. And now comes a new threat, malnutrition. There are up to two million people in Kabul and even daily Soviet airlifts of food can't keep up with demand. So it was extremely difficult, very cold. I'm talking about winter um, days. Uh, it was very cold, and I remember I was craving for bread. Um, the markets were empty. Uh, not many food items were available. Um, there were incidents where street dogs were too hungry and they attacked, you know, kids. In the conflict between East and West, there's a large group of Afghan people no one is talking about. Western governments talk of the need to liberate Afghanistan. But for the country's women, it could mean the opposite. During Russian time, women in the cities uh, relatively enjoyed uh, freedom. They could go to school, uh, you know, they could uh, wear whatever they wanted, uh, and they relatively, um, they enjoyed, you know, their basic rights. Communism became linked with women's emancipation. Under President Najibullah, women enjoy Western-style freedoms and a certain measure of independence. In the capital, for instance, they're able to enter higher education or seek jobs in the civil service or industry. My sisters, you know, they had no issues uh, going out in the street uh, with Western clothes as well. Like in uh, other cities and uh, rural areas, it was a very different story. Not many schools were functioning. Women could only go out if they had burqa or proper hijab. So it was a distinction between life for women in cities and life women in rural areas. Or in places where the rebels have control, female students come under threat. There have been reports of 
reports that some female students at the un university have been attacked by the Mujahideen. Uh, you, as you know, the Mujahideen lo don't like the education for the girls and for the women. Uh, because of that, they don't like to, uh, the, the women, the girls, go to the university and uh, study. And because of that, they attack to the university to... Uh, women are empowered. Uh, they are given opportunities of education. Then, of course, they will have that uh, ability to choose for themselves. Uh, what happened to the female students? How were they attacked? They threw acid in the face of the woman. Some decide to fight back. <laughs> These are women drawn together by the threat posed by the forces of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, we join with the militia because we defend with the uh, women rights. We will uh, fight against counter-revolution in our country. Although they are not fighting in the front line, many have received full military training and are ready to defend to the death their newly won rights. Fatima joined up five years ago. Her aims are twofold, she says, to defend the government and women's rights. If the fundamentalists come to power, the future for some women is likely to be a step backwards. Well, there were some very strong women that I came across over the years who had well understood uh, the virtues of a more secular environment and, and deeply unhappy about the support of Islamic extremists by the great powers playing games uh, against each other. I mean, they were certainly fantastically important group, half the population within the country, uh, that were the real victims, I think, of that succession of unhappy interventions. John F. Kennedy Airport, New York, September 1983. 269 people board a Korean airline 747 bound for Seoul. The plane will not arrive at its destination. At 3.30 a.m. Seoul time, the Korean airliner disappears. It has been shot down. Wreckage begins to appear along the Japanese coast. After a week, the Soviet Union admits responsibility. Here is a brief segment of the tape, which we're going to play in its entirety for the United Nations Security Council tomorrow. There is conversation there about the pilots arming and then disarming their heat-seeking missiles, about being locked on and then making sure they had the authority to fire, and they fired. On the night of the disaster, it was dark with gale force winds. The flight strayed off course and entered Soviet airspace over the Kamchatka Peninsula. The Russians believed the jumbo jet was a U.S. spy plane. Four jet fighters were scrambled from the Sokol Air Force Base. Then in those, uh, in those tapes, it is clear that they are reporting the, the aircraft destroyed and, and the planes are discontinued. You know, you don't arm and fire a heat-seeking missile as a warning shot. Once that missile is released, it seeks out and hits its target. Two missiles were on target. One exploded just behind the tail of the plane, the other by the left wing. The cabin of the 747 decompressed. Oxygen masks were deployed. It took 12 minutes for Korean Airlines Flight 007 to crash. Despite fury in Korea, the Russians claimed the strike was legitimate. But there were tapes of actual uh, radio transmissions by the, by the Russian pilots of several planes. And, and, and it, it, it is clear beyond any doubt that the Soviet Union did in fact shoot down this unarmed commercial airliner. The USSR holds a press conference. One of the pilots states the airliner ignored tracer warning shots. And there is no conversation about warning shots or tracer bullets or anything of the type. What really happened is kept hidden. 
The USSR finds the cockpit voice recorder, but does not tell anyone for nine years. Mad World. Mutually assured destruction. Today on Mad World, an island invasion causes international uproar. Grenada, we were told, was a friendly island paradise for tourists. Well, it wasn't. The USA openly trains terrorists. Today, the Everglades area of Florida is a training ground for would-be counter-revolutionary guerrillas. And crimes against humanity. Allegations of drug smuggling, gun running, and human rights violations. Almost bring down a president. But let me put this in capital letters. I did not know about the diversion of funds. The Cold War gets hotter than ever. It became too dangerous, much more dangerous than, you know, when Russians were there. You could be killed any time. And space age weapons change the course of the nuclear age. They said, holy mackerel, they might actually be able to pull this off. October 1983. The USSR is fighting for control in Afghanistan. The Cold War has been reignited. The USA is on tenterhooks. It appears the USSR has renewed the drive to conquer new territories. Both sides are closely watching a small island 200 kilometers off the South American coast. One of the prettiest of the Caribbean islands, Grenada's had nearly two years of radical socialist rule under Prime Minister Bishop. Grenada, a sovereign state since it was given independence by Britain in 1974, with the Queen as its head of state. It is a developing country. The island also produces a third of the world's supply of nutmeg and is renowned for growing some of the best cocoa beans in the world. Prime Minister Maurice Bishop is a Marxist. He is modeling his government on his communist neighbor, Cuba. This is a government project, and the cement is donated by Cuba, one of many examples of aid from Fidel Castro. The Grenada government is also providing long-term, interest-free loans on completed dwellings, so that almost all Grenadians will be able to afford them. For the first time in their lives, many Grenadians will be able to exchange their wooden shacks for the comforts of a modern home. Grenada is only a three and a half hour flight from Miami. The USA and most Caribbean nations are alarmed by a second Marxist country in their corner of the world. Apart from Cuba, all the other Caribbean governments are moderate or right-wing. And so the voice of Radio Free Grenada is often a lonely one, and the new Reagan administration in Washington could make it lonelier still. So far, the Americans are on friendly terms with Grenada. Another area where Cuba is giving help is public health. There are some Peace Corps volunteers from the United States working here too, but the chief clinic doctor is Cuban. The influx of medical personnel from Cuba has doubled the number of doctors in Grenada, and the benefit to the people is visible already, especially among the young. Looking at it in more material terms, I would say the greatest achievements have been in the area of social benefits, in terms of improvements in health, education. It has come at a critical time when we needed it most. Like all revolutionaries, Maurice Bishop hopes that educating the young in the new ideas will help to create a country built according to his vision. Bishop introduces equal rights, equal pay, and maternity leave for women. But his biggest project will be the downfall of Grenada. He invites Cuban troops and workers in. The new airport project mentioned by Maurice Bishop will cost an estimated $40 million, a quarter of that sum coming from Cuba. Previously, foreign visitors have had to fly into Barbados and then continue by boat or small aircraft. A boost in tourism is also hoped for when the new airport is operational. Officials have spoken in terms of a tripling of tourists. 
tourism is the big hope for lifting this developing nation out of poverty. But Grenada's rich neighbor to the north is planning to put a stop to that. There have been rumblings in the American State Department that Cuba might want to use the new airport as a staging post for airlifting its troops to trouble spots around the world. The U.S. administration has even released satellite pictures of the complex. Officials claim that a recent survey of 25 New York travel agents resulted in 19 of them advising inquirers not to go to Grenada because the beaches were covered with barbed wire and there were Cuban and Soviet troops all over the place. 17 of them then admitted the information came from the U.S. State Department. All our reporting team saw, though, was bamboo huts and bikinis. Behind this idyllic scenery, turmoil is about to erupt. Prime Minister Bishop has so far refused to hold elections. His deputy stages a violent takeover, and within 24 hours, Bishop is killed. Grenada, we were told, was a friendly island paradise for tourism. Well, it wasn't. The new leader, Bernard Cord, is more extreme in his communist views. It takes the USA nine days to react. Okay, be advised that there, uh, as the gunships passed over, there were uh, quite a bit of ground fire uh, from, the, from the immediate area. There is gunfire directly outside of our campus, right? and maybe not more than uh, then Grenada's flirtation with the Marxist government came to an end in 1983, when U.S. troops flooded in. The United States invades the nation of Grenada. Well, Granada was the, the classic case of the, the sledgehammer and the, the nut, the full might of American military power being used to sort of quash this descent on a tiny island in the, the Caribbean. It's a lovely piece of real estate, remarked American Secretary of State George Shultz when US forces arrived, supposedly to rescue Grenada from its radical turn. In the final hours of the Battle for Grenada, the Americans were still pouring in more combat troops who arrived at the new airport, one way following another. The build-up coincided with the arrival of helicopter gunships, all urgently needed reinforcements to end the fighting as quickly as possible. In the words of one American officer, they were using whatever it takes to free the island. We saw planes coming in, going out. We saw the battleships. Uh, Radio Free Grenada that was, uh, we think, bombed on, exploded three or four times. We were told afterwards it was an ammunition uh, site that they had blown up. In addition, the Americans have been making repeated airstrikes to weaken the Cubans and to allow ground forces to take up better positions. The Cuban forces will continue fighting until they are, as long as they are still under attack. The invasion of Grenada by Ronald Reagan probably sent a message to Castro because the Cubans were in Grenada in large numbers and it was the first and only time that the two sides came head to head directly militarily and the Cubans retreated very quickly. With the battle for the capital St. George's over, the Americans turned their full attention to the south. I'm not sure that it was very necessary for the enhancement of America's military power and certainly didn't do much for US reputation, but it was one of those many, many events during the Cold War years in which just ideology and determination to maintain power blocks led to all sorts of uh, extravagances. Grenada is a British Commonwealth nation. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is not informed of the attack. 
Hello, Margaret Thatcher. Listen, we regret very much the embarrassment that's been caused you, and I'd just like to tell you what the story is from our end out here. Tapes of a private phone call between President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher have just been released. When your word came of your concerns, by the time I got it, the zero hour had passed and our forces were on their way. The British leader does not come to the aid of Grenada's Marxist government. I'm very much aware of sensitivity. Well. And, but the, the action's underway now, and we just hope that um, it will be successful. The United Nations General Assembly puts out a statement about the U.S. invasion, calling it a flagrant violation of international law. Members agree by 108 to 9 votes. I believe our government has a responsibility to go to the aid of its citizens if their right to life and liberty is threatened. Reagan believes that the nation that had been helping Grenada may have had more sinister designs. We had to assume that several hundred Cubans working on the airport could be military reserves. But as it turned out, the number was much larger and they were a military force. 600 of them have been taken prisoner, and we have discovered a complete base with weapons and communications equipment, which makes it clear a Cuban occupation of the island had been planned. That at the very heart of what the Soviets wanted to do and what the Soviet system was, was about spreading communism globally. It wasn't about containing communism, it was about spreading communism. So I have no doubt that if allowed, Cuba would have essentially turned Grenada into a communist outpost, not of Cuba, of the Soviet Union, that was not only paying the way, but directing the strategy. Now that they've occupied the island, the Americans are determined to make sure Grenada does not come under future communist control. The purge of Marxist supporters continues and remaining elements of the Grenada army will be disbanded. Almost a week after the invasion and the Americans are satisfied that their main objectives have been achieved, but their continuing presence is being counted in weeks rather than days. Grenada needs a period of healing right now. There are growing signs that the island community is slowly returning to some semblance of normality. The Governor General, Sir Paul Schoon, places great emphasis on shops and offices opening up as soon as possible to restore people's faith in the future of Grenada. Its economy was reshaped according to principles of privatization, free trade and market-driven development. Grenada's first experiment with capitalism since independence begins. After six years of American stewardship, Grenada is deeper in debt than at any time in its past. Unemployment runs at around 30%, inflation about the same. Hard drug use, household burglary and violent street crime, all of which were rare a few years ago, are becoming widespread. But the reality is that the Americans have brought window dressing and little real development. We are looking for a better life in this country. That's what we need. The tiny island of Grenada could have been a tropical paradise. But through mismanagement and foreign interference, it now has all the hallmarks of a nation that's fallen into a coma. Now, the administration wants to give the Contras $100 million more. Mostly military aid. Why? In God's name, why? Many developing countries are trying out communism. For the USA, every time it puts out a fire, 
war seemed to flare up. Well, the United States was more worried about Nicaragua than they probably were a lot of other places because that's over here in our hemisphere. Now, let me show you the countries in Central America where weapons supplied by Nicaraguan communists have been found. Honduras, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala. The problem for the Sandinistas... It began in Nicaragua in 1979. The population rises up against the country's military dictator. How long do you think this war will now last? I'll give it a week. And you think it'll all be over then? Anastasio Somoza will be the last in line from a family that has ruled Nicaragua for 43 years. They own big industrial monopolies and have siphoned off huge quantities of international aid. The Somoza family are worth about a billion U.S. dollars. This situation is not going to be over until there is an end to the undeclared war between communism and the private enterprise people who believe in democracy and republican government. I was born in Managua, Nicaragua, many years ago. The equality was the need, the wealth distribution was the need, and so they had to change some of the things. The people didn't want to have that sort of government anymore. There was no opportunity for the poverty. It's one of the things that took the government down. It took a determined popular uprising to defeat Somoza and his hated National Guard. His regime had become so corrupt that in the end, even the middle classes opposed it. In July 1979, after 18 months of open revolution, the rebel army enters the capital, Managua. I clearly remember that day because I went to the plaza and there was this euphoria from the whole country that Somoza had finally left. He had fled the country, he went to South America, to Paraguay to live, where he got killed months later. He left behind a country ravaged by the war which claimed 50,000 lives. Because the departing summer sisters took with them all the cash and gold reserves they could carry, Nicaragua's agriculture and industry have been in a bad way. The rebels call themselves the Sandinistas. They are determined to wipe out all traces of the Somoza regime. My father worked for the government in the early 60s and 70s. If you were a Somoza supporter, you'd be in trouble. My father was at home in, an, in, in the evening. He went to the backyard to have a look so he could see behind the fence, like two men hiding behind trees. They had guns, and so he instantly thought that they were coming for him. You know, men were taken away from the houses, executed at gunpoint in front of their own family members. And so we went to the people next door, through, through the backyard. In the morning, the next door neighbor on the other side said, look, just as good you left because they were prepared. They came back with, with weapons and there was a big car outside. Norma's father fled to safety in Costa Rica. The Sandinistas are communists. Just like the Grenadian communists, they bring socialist reforms to their people. When the Sandinistas took over in 1979, they had great ideas, plans of land reform, literacy programs. But also, like Grenada, the Sandinistas are receiving support from the USSR and Cuba. They've welcomed Cuban teachers and doctors in their hundreds, and they insist their role is purely humanitarian. For example, to attack the causes of infant mortality because in the past, illness and disease claimed the life of one in every 10 infants here. The human face of revolution was shown in a determined drive to provide health and education facilities for all the people, something which simply did not exist under Somoza. The Somoza supporters are also getting assistance from the USA. There was a, a decision made, and the basic strategy was to begin to roll back the gains that the communists had made, not only from 75 to 80, 
but in uh, since 1945. Then Riga gets into power and then starts funding contracts, which meant for the people in Nicaragua, war wasn't over. Today, the Everglades area of Florida is a training ground for would-be counter-revolutionary guerrillas. Their families and friends were on the losing side in Cuba and Nicaragua. They lost property and power, and now they want it back. With a little help from their friends, they believe it's possible. The kind of people that we're talking about, that when that was the former National Guard, men and women who worked for the Somoza government before, and there were police men and police women who had a passion about the Somoza government, who fully supported him. So the tactics were, um, we're going to scare people off, we're going to make it back to power, we've got new leaders. They stabilized the economy, they stabilized the peace and quiet time, the period that Nicaragua had gained at the time, which I had only lived for a short time. The anti-government guerrillas are called the Contras. They are the key to the U.S. fight against communism in Central America. In the past, the Contras haven't had to ask. Since 1984, most of their money, $87 million, has come from American taxpayers. It's estimated that 20 to 30 million dollars more has come from private donors. As with all Cold War proxy conflicts, the other side is receiving arms and funds from the other superpower. Nicaragua and El Salvador are classic cases of where the Soviet Union used Cuba as a proxy to wage war against the Americans. Managua says 3,000 men and 24 helicopter gunships were used during the 15-day operation in the dense jungle of northern Nicaragua. 56 Contra rebels were said to have been killed, while eight Sandinista soldiers lost their lives. If it hadn't been for us, the United States would already have to be fighting in Central America. That we have done for this country. We have put up the blood, while this country have put up, has put up a few dollars. The Contras are running a campaign of terror against the Sandinista government. They are accused of rape, torture, and murder. It was a very sad time for Nicaragua because there were a lot of killings and a lot of you know, people dying in the mountains. And just hearing on the news about you know, so many people were found dead in, in mass graves. More evidence of atrocities emerge. There'll also be investigations into the way the Contras operate in the light of allegations of drug smuggling, gun running, and human rights violations. It's probably impossible to, uh, for the Contra atrocities and some of the drug dealing that was alleged to have gone on to have been prevented. In any war, there's going to be uh, these types of uh, things that happen. Another indication of the turmoil, the death squads have returned. Figures vary, but Western diplomats here put the average at 10 killings a day, most by the army or the right wing. In defiance of the president, the U.S. Congress blocks further funding to the Contras. But the fighting continues in Nicaragua. Each side is still clearly being supported by a Cold War superpower. Soviet-supplied ground-to-air missiles were used to shoot down the DC-6, which had dropped supplies to Contra rebels inside Nicaragua. At least four crewmen died. Another, captured after parachuting clear, confirmed that 11 packages of arms and supplies were dropped before the rockets hit. He said the captured crewman claimed the plane took off from Honduras's Swan Island, where he said 30 Americans were stationed. So we hope that rationality will prevail, will prevail in the U.S. Congress, and they will opt for peace and not for war in Central America. President Reagan appeals to his country to continue the war. My fellow Americans, I must speak to you tonight about a mounting danger in Central America that threatens the security of the United States. 
This danger will not go away. It will grow worse, much worse, if we fail to take action now. Aren't you then saying that you advocate the overthrow of the present government of Nicaragua? Well, what I'm saying is that this present government was one element of the revolution against Somoza. Is the answer yes, then? To what? I mean, to the question, aren't you advocating the overthrow of the present government? If you Not want to substitute another form of what you say was the revolution. Not if the revolutionary government say, uh, come on back in, let's straighten this out and institute the goals. If you ask someone who witness who lived through that era, they will tell you that the U.S. did not let them govern for 10 years. And that's the lost era that they called the 80s. Reagan tries everything to try to win over the American people. Gaddafi used to be far away, but now he sits on our doorstep, supplying arms and terrorist experts to the communists in Nicaragua, only two hours away from our borders. All of this, only two hours away from where we live. Support the president on Nicaragua. Should the United States be trying to influence the government of another nation in this hemisphere? I don't think the Sandinistas have a decent leg to stand on. Reagan cannot get enough support in the Senate. His next move threatens to take down his government. We don't know the exact amount yet. Our estimate is that it is somewhere between 10 and 30 million dollars. Reagan is accused of illegally circumventing Congress. His government is selling arms to Iran and diverting profits to the Nicaraguan Contras. I think in terms of the uh, process with respect to the U.S. Constitution, the, there, there's a legitimate reason for an inquiry into President Reagan's uh, knowledge and involvement in supporting the uh, Contras. But let me put this in capital letters. I did not know about the diversion of funds. For six years, the Contras have been fighting to overthrow the government of Nicaragua, relying on the generosity of others to pay for their fight. The Iran-Contra affair is an international scandal. Congressional hearings into the Iran arms affair are expected to begin next month, with renewed pressure on the central figures, Admiral John Poindexter and Colonel Oliver North, to tell all they know. Heads must roll. Vice Admiral John Poindexter has asked to be relieved of his assignment as assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and to return to another assignment of the Navy. Lieutenant Col Colonel Oliver North has been relieved of his duties on the National Security Council staff. Colonel North and Admiral Poindexter believed they were doing what I would have wanted done, keeping the democratic resistance alive in Nicaragua. To prevent uh, the U.S. government supporting the Contras uh, had uh, a little bit of a loophole in it, and the uh, Ollie North, who was a good friend of mine and a little bit unusual, took advantage of that, and uh, support was continued. Uh, and so there is a constitutional question there and a legal question as to whether uh, what the United States actually did was wrong or not. Mr. Hamilton, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully and regretfully decline to answer the question based on my constitutional rights. The hearings find no evidence against Reagan. The verdict that Oliver North acted alone is, for some, hard to believe. Uh, it just defies logic that uh, people at the level of uh, field grade officers uh, would uh, be making foreign policy for the United States. Documents that may shed light on the illegal Contra funding are secretly shredded. I was aware the resistance was receiving funds directly from third countries and from private efforts, and I endorse those endeavors wholeheartedly. The fighting and dying have spread beyond the borders of Nicaragua. The five Central American presidents have joined together, and they have asked us not to send any more destructive weapons into their region. Central America is a war zone, fired up by the big Cold War enemies. that the main reasons for the failure in a ceasefire lie with Washington, Moscow, and La Habana. 
Irregular military forces are incompatible with the peace plan. There are no parallel routes for war and peace in Central America. El pueblo organizado y armado en las milicias populares sandinistas. No answers. The president of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, is a force for reason in Central America. External aid to the insurgent rebel forces must be discontinued. They will become the main cause that makes peace impossible in our region. Why don't you listen to President Arias, who opposes Contra aid? The Contras are not the solution in Central America. The Contras are the problem. Once the war was won, as the Sandinistas like to put it, they should have let them govern the way they thought it was better for the country. Without the interruptions, these people would have died. Looking back, uh, Nicaragua was uh, probably not as big a threat to um, spreading communism to the, the Western Hemisphere as it was originally thought. July 1987. All aid from the USA to the Contras is finally stopped. Now, the path toward a ceasefire is much easier. We have removed a very important obstacle. The Contras did not win because of lack of funding. The US government could not support them anymore. Nicaraguans took to the streets in a carnival atmosphere. With the economic situation deteriorating as a result of the war, and as well as Nicaraguans, some American volunteers in Managua also celebrated. Maria Zuniga, originally from Minneapolis, expressed her feelings. There was a great victory for the Nicaraguan people. There was a great victory for all of those of us, of you, who have worked so hard in solidarity with Nicaragua. Oscar Arias is given a Nobel Peace Prize in 1987 for his work in Central America. Nicaragua is emotionally and financially exhausted. In the dawn of the Sandinista Revolution, one of the proudest boasts was the gradual elimination of illiteracy. Now, like healthcare, the educational system is blighted by the economic climate. And the most vulnerable fall prey to disease Epidemic and hunger have reached levels associated with the poorest of third world countries. Sandinista advances in preventative medicine have been reversed. 70% of those under the age of six are malnourished. Gastroenteritis is a ruthless killer. Ten years on, another sound is ringing out in Nicaragua. It's a cry born of a decade of suffering, of a cruel war. The nuclear arms race is about to go into hyperdrive. March, 1983. President Reagan launches a futuristic defense program. It will have nuclear satellites, rail guns, and X-ray lasers, all based in space. You're talking about ballistic missiles traveling at very high rates of speed, in large numbers in some cases, uh, multiple warheads, lots of the unknown locations, minutes to react at best. It was a defense system which would actually shoot down surface-to-surface -surface missiles before they reach their target. It's the path for both sides to a safer future, a system that defends human life instead of threatening it. SDI will go forward. The Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, a collection of sensors and weapons designed to destroy incoming Soviet nuclear weapons. And that's why by pursuing SDI, which is a defense against offensive missiles, we're moving away from the so-called policy of mutual assured destruction by which nations hold each other hostage to nuclear terror and destruction. The concept of mutually assured destruction goes right out the window 
and the U.S. reemerges with an absolutely unassailable strategic advantage. Many believe mutually assured destruction has kept the two superpowers from direct conflict for nearly 40 years. Reagan does not agree. He describes MAD as a suicide pact. As I told the British Parliament in 1982, we seek to rid the world of the two great nightmares of the post-war era, the threat of nuclear war and the threat of totalitarianism. Reagan wants an alternative to MAD, a high-tech scenario that will allow the USA to survive a nuclear attack. You know, I mean, you were pushing the boundaries of physics, you were pushing the boundaries of materials. It's constantly changing and morphing, and so nothing ever really gets to a configuration where it's actually bought and deployed. And part of that is because of the difficulty of actually accomplishing uh, a shield to, to shield us from a bunch of incoming ICBMs. The problem is, none of this technology exists. I made it clear that our SDI program will continue and that when we have a defense ready to deploy, we will do so. The American Physical Society states that it will take 10 more years of research to establish whether SDI is even feasible. You're dealing with a, a saturation attack, and so you've got to have some technology that is uh, quick. So many of these things are, are just almost uh, uh, impossible to do, and yet, uh, somehow the Russians believed uh, that we could do all this. We leaked enough of the capabilities that we were starting to develop to the Soviets that they said, holy mackerel, they might actually be able to pull this off. But it was a, a bit of poker. Uh, it was just another example of America saying, we have technological superiority. You guys know it. We're going to develop something that's going to uh, make your uh, offensive nuclear forces less capable and less effective, and you better worry about it. The USSR is by far the biggest country in the world, but it cannot afford to develop its own SDI. A new leader is about to take his nation on a very different course. At the start of his leadership, Gorbachev looked like his predecessors, but he soon made it clear that his style was to be very different. March 1985. Mikhail Gorbachev is the first leader of the USSR who did not live through the Russian Revolution. Gorbachev I did work with as an interpreter uh, and uh, had a really good impression of him as a human being. He was one of the few heads of state that I've worked with who would really treat you as a human being, approach you, was willing to take a photograph with you, have a little chat. Since stepping onto the diplomatic merry-go-round when he became leader of one of the most powerful nations on earth, Mikhail Gorbachev hardly seems to have paused for breath. Old guard ideas are out, and Russia is offered a new revolution. Political and social changes had to be made. Perestroika or reconstruction was, he wrote, the only way forward in a new atmosphere of glasnost or openness. When President Gorbachev came into power, there was a sea change of attitude. He introduced things called glasnost and perestroika to, I think, make efforts to reduce the tension in the world. Gorbachev grew up operating combine harvesters, gained a law degree, and quickly rose through the Communist Party ranks. His first meeting with Ronald Reagan is a crossroads for the Cold War. Just over a month ago, General Secretary Gorbachev and I met for the first time in Geneva. Our purpose was to begin a fresh chapter in the relations between our two countries and to try to reduce the suspicions and mistrust between us. But the relationship between the superpower leaders only threatens to increase mutual mistrust. Gorbachev and Reagan begin a series of game-changing talks in Reykjavik. The agenda, reducing nuclear weapons. The talks come to an abrupt halt. In Iceland last October, we had one moment of opportunity that the Soviets dashed because they sought to cripple our strategic defense initiative, SDI. I wouldn't let them do it then, 
I won't let them do it now or in the future. President Gorbachev lobbies hard to stop SDI. But while here, he's expected to push Mitterrand for French support over his campaign against Reagan's strategic defense initiative. I've made it clear that there's no way that we can give up SDI, which we believe is offering an opportunity for peace for the world. And as Mr. Gorbachev carries out the formal program of his visit, here a wreath laying at the Arc de Triomphe, the Soviet leader is leaving no chance untaken to ram home his message, which is that there must be no arms race in space. Gorbachev believes if he puts money into a competing SDI program, the Soviet economy will be crippled. He spoke of the efforts to find an alternative and mocked America's strategic defense initiative as a dangerous illusion. In its place, the Soviet leader proposed a complete ban on all space weapons and a 50% cut in the Soviet and American missiles aimed at each other's soil. By the mid-1980s, hopes of warming relations between East and West are fading. Between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The other day, the, uh, uh, the Soviet officials were complaining about such things as uh, Rambo movies and Rocky movies, which cast the Soviets in a bad light. Uh, do you think that's an appropriate sort of thing? Are you talking to your friends in Hollywood about the kind of movies being made these days? <laughs> no, I was talking to my friends in Hollywood back at a time when they seemed to be making pro-communist pictures. Mr. President, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, really blasted you on Soviet television yesterday, accusing you of provoking another Cold War and criticizing you for refusing to negotiate on the test ban treaty. I evidently wasn't aware of that he said all those things, things about me. Uh, there, he must have been reason, reading Pravda and Tass too much. Why don't we send him some American newspapers? He was asked by press conference, Mr. President, what is your strategy for dealing with the Soviet Union? And he, he kind of smiled his normal uh, smile and glint in his eye, and he said, my strategy is we win, they lose. I just want to follow up. Do you think you're going to see Mr. Gorbachev again during your term, or do you think he's thinking that he'll wait for the next president to negotiate an arms control agreement? I have to believe there's reason for optimism. August 1987. Another attempt to warm up the Cold War is made. I am optimistic that we'll soon witness a first in world history, the sight of two countries actually destroying nuclear weapons in their arsenals. A ray of hope pierces the Cold War cloud. A treaty is drawn up that will turn the tide on the nuclear arms race. We're making real progress on the global elimination of an entire class of nuclear weapons. The US and Soviet Intermediate Range, or INF missiles, President Reagan extends a hand of friendship. And Mr. Shevardnadze presented a letter to me from General Secretary Gorbachev, who has accepted my invitation to come to Washington for a summit beginning on December 7th. In December, the first Soviet leader to step foot on U.S. soil in 12 years is greeted by the American public. Common sense has won. Reason has won. People want to live in a world in which they would not be haunted by the fear of nuclear catastrophe. People want to live in a world in which everyone would enjoy the right to life, freedom, and happiness. The strongest of all warriors are those two, time and patience. December the 8th. The treaty to destroy all intermediate range nuclear missiles is ready to be signed. But I will venture to say that what we are going to do, the signing of the first ever agreement eliminating nu nuclear weapons, has a universal significance for mankind, both from the standpoint of world politics and from the standpoint of humanism. It is a milestone in both the relationship between Reagan and Gorbachev and a turning point in global history. Yes, yes, I recognize that. He was a great man. And not only a great man of America. Yes,
Mikhail Gorbachev, also makes plans for peace much closer to home. He wants the Soviet Union to pull out of the Afghan war. Anybody who goes in, into Afghanistan is crazy. <laughs> Soviets were more so, perhaps, because it was also kind of a desperate act to reinforce their credentials, to expand their sphere of influence and all that. Ended up, obviously, in a total military disaster. During the course of the war, uh, the Americans' uh, support of the Northern Alliance uh, kept uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, from really uh, sort of conquering Afghanistan. We had gotten bogged down in Vietnam and other places. We sort of returned the favor to them. The Afghan problem remains Gorbachev's biggest foreign affairs dilemma. When he addresses the United Nations General Assembly early in December, it's thought likely he'll repeat his claim that Pakistan is interfering with the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is draining the Soviet Union's economy and destroying too many lives. It has become Russia's Vietnam. It's difficult for our soldiers. It's difficult for the Afghanis. It's time to reach peace there. Mitino Cemetery outside Moscow. Here, the graves of young men who've fallen in the war, Gorbachev's called a bleeding wound. It was a, a deeply hostile environment then and now for outsiders, and the Soviets certainly paid that price. Geneva, 1988. An agreement for peace is reached. Excellencies. a most significant achievement. They represent a major stride in the effort to bring peace to Afghanistan. Beginning on May 15th, to withdraw 50% of their troops in the first three months, in other words, and to complete the withdrawal of all troops by February 15th, 1989. In 1989, as Russian left, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the situation became very, very desperate. Kabul was um, under attack. Um, you know, there were many, many rockets um, hit and shot at uh, different parts of Kabul and major cities. Soviet entrance into Afghanistan, whether or not they were invited or whether or not they were just seizing an opportunity for geostrategic advantage. It was an absolute catastrophe um, for the Soviet Union, just as it unhappily rather proved to be uh, years later for the uh, Americans. The Mujahideen have been allied with the USA for 10 years. For them, the peace treaty does not go far enough. assured destruction. In part eight of Mad World, upheaval spreads like wildfire across Europe. She didn't manage to get down in time and they shot her in the stomach, dead. The push for freedoms in the East were very touchy. A new era begins to emerge and brutal barriers are broken down. I am happy that this is opened here. This was the important point. As a global superpower cracks apart. Thousands of Tadzik stoned, burned and looted. Official denials. Many thousands are paying the price of the Cold War. Their demands are basic. For food, for medicine, for a place to die. But there is an end in sight 
before the turmoil. A sense of optimism about the future. My God, the world is our oyster. June 1989. The Soviet Union has been defeated in Afghanistan. The USA is spending billions of dollars on a space-age defense against nuclear weapons. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is relaxing the rules at home. As the decade draws to a close, it looks as though the USSR is becoming less of a threat. But some of the Eastern Bloc countries have become more brutal than their Soviet masters. Refugees plunge into the Danube, hoping to reach the Yugoslav patrol boats or swim to the far shore. Many don't make it. Their bodies are washed up against the dams where the Romanians collect them to bury them in mass graves. Romania, a brutal dictator, has been ruling for 24 years. My wife was three months pregnant when we crossed. She shouted, look out. I threw myself on the ground. She didn't manage to get down in time, and they shot her in the stomach, dead. The country's leader is Nicolae Ceausescu. He has inherited a police state. Dissent is punished by imprisonment and worse. They continually tortured me. I was kept in isolation. Everyone who tries to cross the frontier is considered a traitor. They kicked my teeth out. All Romanians are expected to conform to Ceausescu's edicts. Ceausescu's critics say he wants to destroy everything that is individual about the people of Romania. Villages around Bucharest have already been destroyed as part of Ceausescu's scheme to eliminate rural identity. The people of the village of Christian have been told that they're on the list for demolition. The economy is in meltdown. In the countryside, malnutrition among pregnant women and children is common. A country that was once the richest in Central Europe is now reduced to the level of the poorest developing nations. These pictures, taken by a hidden camera, show people queuing for hours for the most basic foods. December 1989. The country cracks under the pressure. Romania's revolution was triggered in Transylvania, where nearly two million ethnic Hungarians live. In Timisoara, a minor protest snowballs into mass riots. The army is ordered to take control. They open fire. Many are killed, but the mood for change has not been quashed. Other communist states start to simmer with revolution. These demonstrations took place just one year ago, filmed by an underground group. They were stopped by riot police. After 40 years of oppression, Hungary is the first country to push back. Then another joins. An electrician is organizing resistance in Poland. Fate made him a lucky survivor. Born poor, the charismatic strike leader was irrepressible in breaking the communist hold on Poland's trade unions and founding solidarity. Lech Walesa created solidarity in 1980 in a shipyard in Gdansk. The name will come to symbolize the fundamental changes about to erupt across Eastern Europe. Well, anyone who'd witnessed the Hungarian uprising and its quashing and the subsequent intolerance for any kind of dissent within the region um, had to be nervous about what was happening in Poland. The push for freedoms in the East were very touchy. There were a couple of times where I think um, the potential for some form of conflict in Eastern Europe was uh, actually pretty high. Then Poland openly defies communist dictatorship. Elections for a democratic government are held.
the Soviet military is on alert. Gorbachev tells his tanks to stand down. The Eastern Bloc country votes in an unlikely president. Backed by an overwhelming vote of confidence, Poland's first elected president, Lech Wałęsa, swept through the gates of the Lenin shipyard in Gdańsk to pay homage to his beginnings. Warmth and encouragement engulfed the former electrician who throughout the long and turbulent election campaign had invoked the aspirations of the workers. It was a, a pretty heroic enterprise by those who were were pushing the solidarity movement and uh, was a remarkable watershed. He won their support, now he must deliver the promises. Communism has been derailed in Poland. The ripples are spreading fast across the Eastern Bloc. In Hungary, the Communist Party itself is riding the wave of greater freedom. Neither John nor Joseph thought they would ever see each other again. It's a sign of the tremendous change in Hungary within the past few months that such a meeting can take place. About three months ago, it wasn't possible for me to come here to this country. And now entering Hungary with you, uh, I see a sign for a better sort of situation. The government even rewrites the story of the Hungarian leader who 40 years ago, they executed. 300,000 people in Heroes Square, Budapest to mourn the man who was prime minister during the dramatic days of 1956, the symbol of their struggle for freedom. Imre Noj, hanged as a traitor in 58, was finally laid to rest as a hero. For thousands of Hungarian refugees, it was an emotional homecoming. This year at last, Nodge's family and his people poured out the emotions which had been forbidden for so long. My experience is the people are the same Hungarians like before. They are polite, they are nice. The Hungarian people, freedom-loving people. But the fear is still here until this government is gone. But as in Poland, Soviet tanks do not invade. Within a year, John will have nothing to fear. A center-right party wins the election. Communism has been voted out of power in Hungary. Almost difficult to believe that the Hungarians, a small country in, uh, in a big Soviet orbit, were prepared to rise up against one of the most powerful forces, superpowers, uh, in the history of the world. Uh, Hungarians were, were seen as heroes. The picture of the whole of Eastern Europe moving away from the Soviet sphere of domination and giving up on socialism, which was imposed on them, I think is instructive. So as soon as anybody can get away, uh, they run away. And we've supported those efforts with a substantial aid package to Poland, trade benefits for Hungary. Important decisions have been made for freedom or reforms. As two nations race away from communism, a strange footnote on Hungary, the new free market leads to a boom in a specialized sector of the economy. Riding the crest of the sex boom is Hungary's self-styled king of porn, Laszlo Voros. Voros epitomizes the Hungarian who's confused capitalism with the idea of money at all costs. As long as it's profitable for me, I will stay. This kind of business will be running well for a couple of years because this kind of entertainment was forbidden until now. A former optician, Christina now has a new focus in life. I'm not worried about earning my living with my body. I have a good body. 
Like most other aspects of capitalism, the vice trade in Hungary is about pleasing the customer. And in the end, boils down to just one thing, that very Western notion of money. The USA has just elected a new president. The course of the Cold War is in the hands of George H.W. Bush. What conditions would have to be met for you to have a summit with um, uh, Gorbachev, and do you expect to have one in 1989? It's interesting because there's a lot of hope now, a lot of anticipation. We don't want to dash the hopes, but I don't want to raise them to unrealistic heights. Your attitude uh, towards the Soviet Union seems to have shifted a bit uh, since you became president, from deep skepticism to seeming acceptance of their intentions. I don't Why think it's shifted it? as much as you think, Michael. I don't think it's shifted as much. Despite the softer Soviet approach in Europe, Bush is expected to maintain the U.S. hardline attitude. In dealing with the Soviet Union, I am going to continue to keep my eyes wide up, wide open. I will also say, I want to see Perestroika succeed. I want to see it succeed, not fail. Perestroika sums up Gorbachev's vision for the Soviet Union. It stands for restructuring, and is already creating a more open economy and government, friendly to the West. Bang, there it was on the table, restructuring openness. And that, again, had its own unstoppable logic. Once you set that genie out of the bottle, um, there, was no, there was no going back. Everybody was intrigued right around the world with perestroika. This language, these concepts coming from the Russian leadership, it did seem quite remarkable. Perestroika is creating remarkable events which would have been unthinkable only a couple of years earlier. Gorbachev holds elections in the USSR itself. The radical new president can now be voted out. It's a sight that both excites and frightens those in the Soviet Union. For the first time in 70 years, the Soviet leadership was allowing multi-candidate elections for a powerful body. President Mikhail Gorbachev knows that he's taken a risk. Those seeking greater reform are excited. Tensions mount as the name of the new president is announced. Will the man who has taken the USSR back from the brink of the Cold War be thrown out of office? The results send waves of exhilaration across the globe. Mikhail Gorbachev is the first freely elected president of the Soviet Union. Well, I became foreign minister in 1988 and remained so through to 1996. So I was there during the whole end game of the Cold War and in that huge period of excitement about uh, the possibilities of a world you know, without that tension and the possibilities of cooperation at last between uh, Russia and the United States and the Security Council and elsewhere. The new president is building bridges with France, West Germany, and the UK. George Bush makes a move. my great honor to welcome to the White House the President of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Mr. President, the eyes of the world are on you and they are on President Bush. Our nations have the responsibility to leave behind not only the Cold War, but also the conflicts that preceded it. Talks between the two superpower presidents are headline news. The walls, which for years separated the peoples, are collapsing. The trenches of the Cold War are disappearing. The fog of prejudice, mistrust, and animosity is vanishing. Personal relationships also seem to be warming up. President Bush, how was the meeting? Just a minute, wait till I get out of it. <laughs> Without them and the risks that they were willing to take, 
none of this would have happened as remotely, as seamlessly as it did or when it did. The only thing that went wrong is I pride myself as a uh, horseshoe player, and uh, President Gorbachev picked up the horseshoe, never having played the game to my knowledge, and literally, literally threw a ringer the first time. <laughs> By 89-90, you, you had a Soviet Union that was theoretically undergoing perestroika and all that kind of stuff, so he thought, well, these guys aren't that bad, we can look well. If the citizens of the United States had any doubts about the Soviet leader's charm, they were dispelled by this spontaneous walkabout on the streets of Washington. Formal occasions add further sparkle to the talks. We meet at a time of great and historic change in the Soviet Union, in Europe, and around the world. Such profound change is unsettling, but also Exhilarated. Yes, indeed, we used to be enemies or almost enemies. Now we are maybe rivals, at least to some extent. And uh, we want to become partners. We want to go all the way to become friends. The Russians also host a party at their Washington embassy. On the menu is chicken Kiev and caviar. Food, wine, and friendship are flowing. And you know, Americans and Soviets have often tended to think of our two countries as being on opposite sides of almost everything, including the opposite sides of the world. But we share an important northern border, and we are, in fact, next-door neighbors across the Bering Sea. World-changing agreements are drawn up to break down trade barriers and reduce nuclear arms. about to sign agreements concerning many areas of vital interest to our countries and to the world. I would say that maybe this room has seen many important events and many agreements signed, but I think that what is happening now and what you have uh, listed as the results of our work together represents an event of momentous importance not only for our two countries but for the world. And I would like also to shake your hand, Mr. President, so that we congratulate each other. Within six months, a remarkable meeting takes place in Paris. Agreements are made on international security and cooperation. 34 nations are represented. They are from the East and the West. The Cold War is rushing to the finish line. The Iron Curtain dividing East and West is opening under the pressure for change. But not all Eastern Bloc nations are relaxing the reins. East Germany is keeping the doorway to freedom firmly closed. Further south, the first break in the barbed wire border appears when the Hungarians fail to maintain the fence. That was a barbed wire fence, a bit rusty, and with a large hole in it. We crawled through it, and there was a sign which said, Austria. It's the most wonderful day of my life. By August, more than 6,000 had slipped quietly out of Hungary, threading through the vineyards and into Austria, and the hope of a new way of life. One catalyst for change has been a process for East-West understanding, called détente. But with détente, relations have warmed, and in May, part of the Iron Curtain fell along the Austro-Hungarian border. The trickle through the fence dividing Hungary from Austria becomes a flow. Most of the refugees are from one country, East Germany. The open frontier became a magnet for those disenchanted with communism. Throughout the summer, East Germans in particular have gone south to go west. Guards foiled some would-be refugees, but lines of abandoned cars suggest most escapes were successful. A sense of euphoria builds 
as more and more people from Eastern Bloc countries travel to freedom in the West. I think the future for East Germany is black with the communist uh, administration. And what do you think is your future in the West? The future? It will be better. The Hungarians make little effort to stop the mass defections. Holiday trips to Budapest have turned into the journey of a lifetime. Refugee camps spring up around Budapest. Hungary is running out of capacity to cope with the numbers. This is no solution to an international problem. We are not politicians. Politicians have to find a solution to this problem. We only do the humanitarian help. East Germany rushes to close the border with Hungary. But people are now fleeing to embassies and airports in Czechoslovakia and Poland. Bonn provides any East German with automatic citizenship. And so West Germany is their intended destination. But swamped by the flood of applications, several of its embassies in Eastern Europe have had to close their doors in order to cope with the mounting backlog. Trains and planes arrive in West Germany packed with refugees from the east. West Germany too must prepare to cope. Its Red Cross is mounting the largest refugee operation since the Second World War. They're not like refugees at all. It's like they have always been here. Meaning the moment they cross the border they get citizenship, passport, pension rights, they get social, uh, council housing has allocated them, job retraining, uh, even unemployment insurance. Then a cataclysmic event in East Germany is caused by a simple miscommunication. November the 9th, 1989. At a confused press conference, a Soviet minister named Shabowski is about to say the wrong thing under pressure. The 9th of November, the meeting, the conference, was just like any other conference. No one expected anything spectacular to happen. Politburo member Shabowski made the statement that travel to the West will be permitted. The press was very aggressive and wanted to know when. When will that start? He couldn't remember, so he shuffled through his papers and he came across a draft that was not approved. But he said, right now. And the rest is history. Border guards, known for their murderous behavior, refused to shoot escaping East Germans. I was in Berlin just a few days after the wall was breached, and there's a wonderful photograph of me with my hand through the wall, shaking an East German border guards. I am happy that this is open here. This was the important point of old Berlin. Here was it where the traffic flow over, and still it will be an important traffic point. West Berlin mayor, Walther Mumper, will be the first mayor of a reunited Berlin. Do you know when the Brandenburg Gate may be opened? <laughs> no, but they will let me know when they will open it. They will let you know. Within three days, bulldozers are brought in and the ultimate symbol of the Cold War divide comes crashing down. Fall of the Berlin Wall causes jubilation, both in Germany and around the world. Yeah, the atmosphere was absolutely indescribable. The sense of optimism about the future. My God, what's you know, what can we do now? The world is the world is our oyster. Many of you had not even been born when the Berlin Wall was erected in 1961.
the Iron Curtain came down. It was an incredible sense of peace and a sense of danger that had left. As Iron Curtain borders are removed across Eastern Europe, the Romanian dictator tries to keep hold of his power. Crowds that used to cower under Ceausescu now feel free to jeer. The army is known for firing on its own people. This time, they do nothing. The dictator and his wife try to escape. They fail. Christmas Day, 1989. Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu are executed by firing squad. The most brutal regime in the Eastern Bloc is no more. Romania begins its long journey to recovery. That entire civilization, whether it was Russia, Ukraine, Romania, you know, that whole region had never known democracy. In the Soviet Union itself, the new freedoms are not working quickly enough. Every day, refugees gather outside government buildings, pleading for homes and food. Every day, the answer's the same. They're told the city's resources are already overstretched. Many have moved to work as hostels on the outskirts of Moscow. Five families to a room. Some people have been here for two years. Their demands are basic. For food, for medicine, for a place to die. The Russian economy is barely able to produce enough to feed the people. Experts have called it a war economy, which can finance satellites and missiles, but can't produce enough soap, meat, or other products. They were really spending 40, 50 percent of their, their GDP on, on military stuff, which was robbing their civilian economy of any future, finally was what broke the back of the Soviet Union. The Soviet economy has been crippled by the Cold War. As a symbol of Gorbachev's commitment to disarmament, tanks were turned into plows. Gorbachev believes in restructuring, but only so far. He is fighting to keep the USSR a communist state. He also desperately needs to modernize his country's industrial base. And for that, he needs Western help, and especially Western technology. There were certain diplomatic overtures that were already starting to occur where it was very clear that the Soviet Union was, was not going to survive. Gorbachev hits the road again, this time not to give up weapons, but to ask for economic support. London, where the flags were out for the leaders of the world's seven richest nations. After a three-month campaign of appeals to individual Western leaders, an invitation had been extended to the Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, to present his case for aid. Arriving in the heartland of capitalism, and despite the Soviet parliament's backing for his economic reform plan, Gorbachev knew that many had criticized his visit to beg for foreign help. The USSR is a nation of nearly 300 million people. Once the iron fist of central control is lifted, no one knows what will happen. It is a difficult and novel task to build a new civilization. Our own house is in need of an overhaul and a fundamental restructuring along the lines of reason and justice. We are aware of the magnitude of this undertaking unprecedented in the history of mankind. Russia is about to face a second revolution in less than a century. In Estonia, two of the main nationalist leaders, Edgar Savistar and Mariu Loristans, were elected with reform-minded party candidates. In Lithuania, the party leader won his seat, but the local president lost his. The independence movement did particularly well. 
In most places, the race for independence is angry and violent. Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, saw at least 20 die in a peaceful nationalist demonstration when the troops moved in. Ukrainian miners, too, called the Kremlin to account with a series of devastating strikes. And people are now fighting to defend their right to choose their own destiny. And that was everywhere. People came out on the street, ordinary men and women, who were willing to, you know, stand in front of the tanks. Too many players hungry to get out from under the sort of centralised yoke to take advantage of the emerging situation. And too many people in the West and elsewhere pressing them to do just that uh, because of their concern about, well, their desire to make sure that, you know, the Soviet Union wouldn't rise up again in any new guise. Gorbachev cracks down on the rebellions. The violence gets worse. Communists are under siege. There appears to be no retreat. For four days, thousands of Tadziks stoned, burned and looted. As Soviet central power weakens, ancient rivals fight for territory. In the Soviet Union's southern republics, the call of Islam is becoming louder. The ancient city of Samarkand in Uzbekistan retains an outward calm, but it too has ethnic riots. Most goods from other parts of the Soviet Union would usually come by train through Azerbaijan. But in August, rail workers there introduced a blockade, apparently in an attempt to starve Armenia into dropping its claim to Nagorno-Karabakh. After numerous violent clashes between the two sides, the region now stands on the brink of civil war. In hospital, a man with 12 bullet wounds in his head lies dying. He was guarding a factory which was attacked. It's the kind of unrest that threatens Mikhail Gorbachev's grand plans for a national rebirth. In the north, despite peaceful elections, the old Soviet style of oppression rears its head. Rumors grow that the order to attack demonstrators in Lithuania has come from Moscow. Then there is no doubt. Pictures of people shot by soldiers and run over by tanks are smuggled out of the country. Despite the violence, Lithuania manages to hold peaceful elections. The February election resulted in a landslide victory for the Soyudis party. Its main pledge was to secede from the Soviet Union and retake the independence which had been lost half a century ago. If Lithuania is allowed to go its own way, it could be the first step in the breakup of the Soviet Union. Lithuania is the first former Soviet Socialist Republic to declare itself an independent nation. August 1991, alarming reports are heard from Moscow. While Gorbachev is overseas, the communist old guard stages a coup. Uh, while we're still watching the situation unfold, and it still is unfolding, all is not clear, it seems clearer all the time that contrary to official statements out of uh, Moscow, that this move was extra-constitutional, outside of the constitutional provisions for governmental change. Uh, clearly, it's a disturbing development, no question about that. And it could have uh, serious consequences uh, for the Soviet society and in Soviet relations with other countries, including the United States. When the Russian president returns, he is held under house arrest. Another ambitious politician stands up to the coup leaders, Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin became the most visible symbol of those bucking the system. The insider turned outsider attracted a huge following with his populist politics. People actually fought to get a chance to hear him at his public meetings. The military claim Gorbachev is ill. The coup, only 72 hours old, was crumbling. Troops were withdrawn from Moscow center. The coup leaders were placed under arrest. For Mikhail Gorbachev, although never really ill, being held captive in his holiday dasher for three days took its toll. Yeltsin is not a communist, 
He wants Russia to become a free market economy. Yeltsin's promise to encourage free debate, if elected, made him popular. I think a lot of Moscovites um, see in his person one of the enemies of bureaucracy. He tells the truth. He tells the truth. Everybody is speaking about. On the 21st of December, 1991, the document that ends the Cold War is signed, the Alma-Ata Protocol. The latest crisis, the signing of an historic agreement between the three mighty republics, Ukraine, Russia, and Bielorussia, effectively marked the formal death of the USSR and ended Gorbachev's personal vision of a wider political union. The mighty superpower, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, is no more. And what would have seemed inconceivable only weeks before, the Communist Party was not only losing its position of power, but being disbanded. But the roots of the Communist Revolution run deep. Vladimir Lenin, the original Russian revolutionary, has surviving relatives, including Olga Ilyanova. It's our history, our culture. They're trying to throw away a whole chapter. You just can't do that. Just because they didn't like Napoleon in France, they can't pretend he didn't exist. He did, and so did Lenin. Those comments from Lenin's surviving niece reflect a minority view in the new allegiance of sovereign states. Olga Ilyanova, holding this photograph of herself as a child with her uncle, sees little comfort in the future. She laments a union that's passed and fears a disunity that may be lurking around the corner. When the Soviet Union disintegrated, the first reaction of myself personally and most people was one of joy because a threat had been removed and all that money spent on weapons could be spent for better reasons. Well, the appeal of egalitarianism, the appeal of absolute redistribution is immense and universal, but of course, that was something that might have been theoretically part of the original communist ideal. But once, under the Leninist and subsequent traditions, the judgment was made that that nirvana could only be achieved through the leadership of an authoritarian party. That ideal essentially completely collapsed. Some refugees from communism in other parts of the world are still not able to return home. I escaped the regime. I escaped tyranny. I escaped dictatorship. I'm a man of principle. I don't come back because basically it's still the same. Still a monopoly of power there. I don't like it. After a 70-year experiment, Russia's communist rule has ended. The Cold War is over. Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who survived the August coup and changed the course of post-war history, was now a president without a union. On Christmas Day, 1991, the man who brought about the end of the Cold War walks away. The new president of Russia is Boris Yeltsin. The end of the Cold War was barely felt by many in the West. The Cold War in many ways is misnamed. It was a very hot war. Think about it, you had Korea, Vietnam, an innumerable number of skirmishes in Africa, Central America. Contrary to popular belief, a lot of lives were lost. Millions of people died. Countries were destroyed and decimated. If you have a, a war and a bunch of people get killed, you certainly appreciate peace for a long time, just like we do when we come back from a war and everybody wants to just be left alone and they don't want to see another war for 50 years. That's the people. The leaders are not necessarily that way because they're not, they're not getting killed. For many escaped dissidents from the East, the end of the USSR comes too late. 
30 years earlier, one of the Soviet Union's Olympic hopefuls made a dangerous decision. My escape was one of the very, very few that attracted the death penalty on charges of high treason. I was a college uh, student and a swimming champion, a batting champion. I was then drafted into the army. Pyotr Patrushev is stationed by the Black Sea on the Turkish border. He decides to swim for freedom. They were really upset because they spent literally billions on, on safeguarding the border. Patrol boats, uh, overhead planes, submarines, radar devices, sonar devices. And so it's supposed to be completely impenetrable. Those who swam, as I finally did, across the Black Sea, a corner of Black Sea, would mostly drown. And one particular night, when you had to just choose your wave height, right, not too much, not too little, because otherwise the searchlights would pick you up if it's too placid. If it's too rough, you'll never make it. It's a 30 to 35 kilometers swim through very rough waters with cold currents. If anything is moving in one direction, they know it's not a dolphin or whatever, you know, they will go, in fact, and drop a depth charge in that area, which would kill every living thing within like three to four square kilometers. After two nights, Pyotr crosses the border. I was just unbelievably lucky. I was a good swimmer. And I had flippers, which give, give you a lot of speed. But uh, to swim that kind of distance with those obstacles, lots of people tried and none succeeded. So I, I just made it the second night only by coming out on the Turkish shore. That was a happy moment, very happy moment. But his freedom comes at a price. I was put on a KGB's wanted list for 27 years. I was on the KGB's wanted list, it means I could be list. You know, and my life was kind of cut into half by separating such brutal and sudden separation with my, my country, my language, my family. Working as a journalist and interpreter, Pyotr had a unique insight to both sides of the Cold War. Six months after this interview, Pyotr passed away. That's what you've got to kind of realize, that there is not only a huge amount of repression that you live under, the, under in those regimes, but that is kind of almost psychopathic kind of personalities. If you look at, you know, Lenin, Trotsky, you know, and, and perhaps even Putin now, you know, you really realize they're not your average leader of the world, you know, they've got quirks, you know. Five communist countries remain today. The most restricted, has changed little since the proxy war of the 1950s. 50 years ago, Mr. Xi manned a gun just like this one. North Korea, not known for welcoming visitors, but an exception is made for Chinese veterans from the Korean War. The late Kim Il-sung, or great leader, ruled the country from its establishment in 1948 until his death 46 years later, a record in the communist world. Kim Il-sung's grandson now rules the country. Kim Jong-un is a hardline communist dictator, a living embodiment of the Cold War. Even under the watchful gaze of the late great leader, the capital is dark and quiet, as capitals go. The former soldiers are here to pay tribute to their fallen colleagues. Mr. Xi was one of the first to cross the Yalu in October 1950 to support beleaguered North Koreans but this is what Mr. Xi came to see. It's the memorial to the Chinese who fought in Korea. Mr. Xi made it back home, but 380,000 of his compatriots didn't. Inside the monument, the tourists gather around a book that records the names of Chinese remembered for their courage. It was a particularly harsh and bitter conflict fought to a stalemate that drags on today. North Korea is still technically at war with the United Nations forces. The document that ended the Korean War was an armistice, not a peace treaty. The Chinese coach party is taken to a place where the ongoing tension between North Korea and the West is most obvious. The tourists are gathering to visit the demilitarized zone, the Cold War's final frontier. 
the border between North and South Korea is very rarely crossed by civilians. For almost half a century, border guards have carefully watched and waited. The paranoia, sense of duty, or perhaps just intrigue, is mutual to both sides. Everyone is watched, always. The greatest fear about North Korea today is that it possesses a nuclear arsenal. The terrible weapon of the Cold War is still very much a threat. Finally, the tour is over. For Mr. Xi, it's been a poignant return to a land he only knew as a soldier. For others, it's good to be back home with their own familiar brand of communism. Communist countries still exist. Nuclear weapons are still armed and ready for action. Is this the start of a new Cold War? By moving the hand of the clock closer to midnight, the BAS Board of Directors is drawing attention to the increasing dangers from the spread of nuclear we weapons in a world of violent conflict that is unfolding. The Cold War as such is over in the sense of two superpowers, you know, really wanting to be absolutely the dominant player on the world stage and intolerant of any kind of physical intrusions into their space or their proxy space around the place. Both sides are implicated in a way, but of course the Soviet side were far more reckless with the human lives and with their kind of gambling than often the West was. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has been indicating the likelihood of global annihilation since they set the hands of this clock to seven minutes to midnight in 1947. The clock has been moved 21 times since then. They are moving the hands of the doomsday clock two minutes closer to midnight. It is now three minutes to midnight. The world is a, is a less secure place, I think, when there were two mighty powers who really ruled the world. It was ugly, but probably more stable. I took the view quite a while back that I wouldn't go back to Cuba until the system changed. I've been waiting now for uh, more than 40, 45 years since we left for, uh, for the system to change. Uh, there are signs of some change, but I'm in no particular hurry to go back. The Cold War followed a time when about 77 million people, almost 3% of the world's population, was wiped out by two world wars. I lived under Adolf Hitler and Nazis and seen the worst of humanity. I seen and lived under Joseph Stalin and witnessed brutality. I also lived under capitalism and 11 U.S. presidents. And to me, capitalism wins out, hands down. The arms race cost hundreds of billions of dollars. For 45 years, the human race lived in the shadow of the most powerful and terrible weapons ever created. In fear of total annihilation. So I think it's important to try and understand how we were able to survive for 40 or 50 years with the ability to destroy the world, you know, 100 times over and not do it. I think we're so lucky that we came out unscathed. You know, knowing what we know now, we were dead close many times. World War III did not happen. Most of us are probably around today because we were protected by the fear of mad, mutually assured destruction. For all the pessimism that's around, for all the gloom that's around, we have learned something and the world does move on. Having achieved freedom, let's use freedom to resolve conflicts and to as an instrument of development.